Wanna be happy? Build a life, not just a business. Hey, it's Evan Carmichael, and this channel was created to help you overcome the number one challenge that is holding you back, a lack of belief in yourself. You watch these videos because you know there's something more inside you too. You've got Michael Jordan level genius at something. So today let's live your best belief life and get some amazing motivation from the one and only Dean Graziosi. Enjoy. Who could you be doing this for? When you want to get up and work out, when you want to take the run, when you want to just take a walk, when you want to say no to the unhealthy food, you know, when your friends are like, oh, stop eating like a bird, stop eating like a cow, eat some real meat, eat some food or whatever it is. It's easy to go, you know, they're probably right. I deserve it. I work hard. Or do you go, no, I'm doing this for my wife. I'm doing this for my husband. I'm doing this for my kids. I'm doing this for me. I'm doing this for my 70-year-old self. You know, it's really hard to teach kids to do better things now so they don't get sick at 50, 60, 70. Really hard. They can't see that far in advance. But I talk to my kids like this all the time, and I know it sinks in at some level. It's like, do this for your 60-year-old self. You want to feel great? I mean, I have some dear friends I went to high school with. I love them to death. But 51 hasn't treated them so well, right? 51 hasn't treated them so well. I, I, this is not, I, I, do, I pray for them. But I remember when I used to make the harder choices, you know, I always say, live the hard way now for an easier life later, or live an easy life now for harder later. I can remember times with some of my the exact friends when I'd make healthier choices or different choices or go to the gym after a night of going out with them and get home at two o'clock and at six o'clock I'm at the gym. Like, you're crazy. Who's crazy? Like now they're like, I literally have one friend who's like, why didn't I listen to you? He's going through a really tough time health-wise, right? Same age as me. Harder now to live a better life in the future. So who would you do that for? So find a who and think about them. When you feel like eating wrong or making bad choices or not going to the gym, who would you do it for? Enthusiasm will always outweigh perfection and preparation. I told you all that stuff about the things I'm not so good at for a reason. Because I got through life, the first part especially, by being enthusiastic. My enthusiasm outweighed that I'm not that intelligent, that I don't have a great IQ. All I know is there's so many people that will obsess on making sure everything's perfect before they engage, making sure everything is prepared perfectly, and years go by. You're much better off getting enthusiasm and jumping in the game and learning as you go. Jump out of the plane and hope the chute opens on the way down. Hope. Most of the time it does. You can't score a touchdown being on the sidelines, but you sure can if you're in the game. So I want you guys to give yourselves a break right now because some of you, if it is real estate, you haven't made your first deal. You haven't talked to a seller or a buyer yet because you're thinking, maybe I'm not an expert yet. I need to get a little more prepared. I need a little more time under my belt. The hell with that. Get in the game. Get enthusiastic. Get enthusiasm and just take action. Action creates momentum. Knowledge without action is just good reading, like we said before. And when you find enthusiasm, uh, let, let me just back up. So where do you find enthusiasm? And here's what I say, is I borrow mine from the past. When I want to be enthusiastic, I look backwards on times that I was scared and still did it. On times when I thought it was going to go wrong, but I made it happen. On times where I had incredible accomplishments. At times where I felt amazing, felt alive. It could be something completely different. It could be a first relationship. It could be anything that lights you up. And borrow that enthusiasm and put it in today's time. Because what it does is it also changes your state of mind. Because here's what I know, when your enthusiasm is down, when you're thinking about everything being perfect, when you're thinking about one step at a time, are you in the right space to take action? When your confidence is down, do you take action? Or do you say, how about when your confidence is down just a little bit and you watch the news? Or you get a friend tell you, oh, stop dreaming. Or the economy's gonna crash, or the market's gonna crash. If your confidence is down and your enthusiasm is down, how does that hit you compared to when you feel on fire? Right? When you're, when you're down and your confidence is just 10% off, you go, well, yeah, maybe things are good enough the way they are. Maybe I'll just leave it where it is. The hell with that. Borrow the enthusiasm from the past and attack each day. And it starts with you being completely honest with yourself on where you are right now in history. Where are you after COVID? Where are you that the world has changed? Where are you with your confidence? 
Where are you with your income? Where are you with your career? Where are you with your happiness around those things? Where are you with your relationship? Where are you with your health, your connection to a higher power? There's lots of things we can use this tool for to get complete honestly, uh, get completely honest because let's just say it like it is. All change starts when you're brutally honest, that you're disturbed by standing still. You're disturbed by inaction. Think about it. That's how we move. That's how the rocket gets off the ground is being disturbed with leaving your life the way it is. So unfortunately, you're like, oh, now I'm listening to this podcast and I'm going to get disturbed. Yes, because if you're agitated, you move. Right. So let's pick your career, your income, what you do for a living. Where are you with that? Are you happy with your career? Are you happy with the business that you started? Are you happy that you started the business, but it's not really going where you want? Listen, we all make decisions for one of two reasons. We're either moving away from something painful or we want to move towards something pleasurable. Right? We either have to get out of this job or we lost our job or it's just toxic or it's not making me the money. I have to move or it's okay. It's not bad, but you know you have another level. You know God designed way more for you than you're doing. And the inaction of either one of those should disturb you, either away from the pain or towards the pleasure. So at any time, you could stop and write this down or come back at another time or type it in your phone. If you were being completely honest about your income, your career, uh, what you do for a living, starting the business or not, any of those, if you were completely honest, where are you? Because all change starts with a starting point, right? All directions on your GPS, you need the starting point. Where are you is the starting point. Now that the world has shifted. Sometimes, you know, things like COVID pull back the curtain and make us, make us really analyze our lives. And we don't want to go back to who we used to be. I get it. I see it every day. Okay. The next thing, if you know where you are now, then we have to decide where do you want to go now, right? Now, where do you want to go? That sounds like an obvious question. I want more success. I want more happiness. I want more joy. If it's not defined, if it's fuzzy, fuzzy targets don't get hit. We need a definitive plan. We need to know exactly what our compelling future is. We need that lighthouse to drive towards. And what is that for you? Most people know what they don't want. That's just a true story. Most people know what they don't want. They're avoiding potholes. They're driving away from problems, but they're not driving towards where they want to go. If you and I jumped in an elevator together and I said to you, hey, it's a year from now and it was the best year of your life. What's that look like? Where do you want to go? Would you be able to literally in four or five sentences tell me where it is you want and where you want to go? Or would you go, wow, good question, Dean. Let me think about it because that's what 90% of the people say. I've been asking people for over a decade. Mm, good question. Let me think about it. How do you know? How can you get to where you want to go if you don't have your GPS on where it is you want to be? What I never understood is when you were in high school or college or just starting out life, you have these dreams, you have the aspirations, you have, this, you have these big goals in some cases, right? And the world tells us that we're dreaming. I mean, think about when we want to step out from the line everybody else is having and go after our own and do our own thing and people saying, hey, get real. Or when you get a Lola, you'll see that that's not. And all of a sudden, you start squashing your dreams. You start playing smaller in your own life to make people around you feel better. And here's the thing, you, you quit your dream, you quit your desire and you take some job that makes somebody else happy and all of a sudden you get somebody's arm around you saying, hey, now you're finally growing up. Really? What if you just decided today that you are gonna, whatever it is you're currently doing it, you're gonna find it to be fun. You're gonna do it to the best of your ability because it's only temporary. It's only part of your journey. It was designed for you so you could know where you really wanna go. When I see people say, I just hate this, I'm just gonna get by till this comes along. What's gonna come along? Think about that. Is everybody become successful? No, only the ones who go after it. So you got the knowledge, you got the wisdom, you're surrounding yourself with, with information that has been proven to work. So what's left? It's taking action. That's the formula. Knowledge plus action equals results. What I'd love for you to do today is an action audit. Are you really putting into play what you are learning? Are you just dabbling? Are, are you over preparing, causing you to be crippled that you're not taking action? And start using whatever it takes to ethically bribe yourself to take action. Listen, today, I didn't want to get up. Simple. 
going to the gym at 5.30. My alarm went off at 5. I really didn't want to go. I'm tired. You hear it my voice. You never hear my voice have a little tiredness. It's, I've been on the move. I've been in a plane every day. I've been teaching every day, talking every day. But what I did is I, I hacked my own brain. I said, if I don't go work out today, how will that make you feel? I didn't work out yesterday morning because I had to get up at 5 o'clock and jump on a plane. I said, you didn't work out yesterday. You're not going to work out today. How will that make you feel? When you play with your kids later, what if you're tired? When you, when you put your pants on, there's a little muffin top on your pants. It doesn't matter what it is. I just use whatever it takes to get me to take action. If it's you saying, hey, in five years from now, I'm still going to be at this job. I'm still going to be stressed. I'm still going to have these bills. I'm still not going to live the life I want. I still can't retire my parents or take care of my kids or put money away in savings or buy the car I want or have the freedom I want. Whatever it takes, get disturbed. Because if you get disturbed, it'll cause action. Or if the opposite of being disturbed, say, if I do this, I get to dream. I get to get the house. I get the life. I get more freedom. I get more control in life. All I'm saying is use whatever it takes in your toolbox, whether it's being disturbed or whether it's getting excited to take action because knowledge, listening to me, listening to books, going to masterminds without implementing it is just wasting your time. I wish someone would have pounded into my brain week after week after week that it's not the end game. It's not the magic money machine. It's not the invention you come up with. Success starts at your core. Success starts with the right habits, with the right principles, with the right values. Everybody's trying to plug in the get rich quick schemes on top of the wrong foundation on top of the wrong rules and you wonder why you go from opportunity to opportunity and you never go deep. You never make the money. You never become a millionaire. Become, never become financially independent. I will scream from the mountaintops. Maybe it's my age. Maybe it's the success I've, I've been blessed to have, but I obsess on looking backwards, understanding what got me here. It wasn't cars when I was in high school. It wasn't cutting firewood when I was in early high school. It wasn't uh, real estate. It wasn't uh, uh, building houses or renting houses or flipping houses. Yes, that was the end result. Writing books, creating courses, doing live events. Yes, that was the end result to massive success in my life. Blessed beyond belief. But if I go upstream, if I really look at what got me here, what powered through unsupportive parents or friends or not having money and not having a college education, not feeling that smart, not having the confidence in some cases, had nothing to do with those. It had to do with the principles. If you really look at the people who evolve, who reach their full potential, who are at the next level, some people might say they admire them or even have envy for them, it's those who can handle the failures. They can, they can handle when things go wrong. I remember reading many years ago an article about Sarah Blakely, the founder of Spanx, and how she had multiple failures before Spanx, in fact, I think even a bankruptcy, don't quote me on that. But when the reporter was asking her, how did you handle those terrible failures, those, those, those things that went wrong and still be able to rebound, in my opinion, reading the story, she was almost like dumbfounded that he would ask such a silly question. When she replied and said that growing up, her dad would ask her multiple times during the week, in fact, even maybe even once a day, what she failed at today. And if she said nothing, then he would say, well, then you obviously didn't push yourself far enough. You were obviously playing it safe. People fail when they push to the limits. And what happened was she changed what failure meant to her at a really early age. She realized, which most every successful person does, that failure is the building blocks to your success. Failure must occur in order to reach your next level. Get really disturbed because when we're disturbed, we move. You stand on hot pavement, what do you do? Do you stand there and go, wow, this hurts. You know, you run your ass off to get off the hot pavement because you're disturbed, because it's painful. Let the pain sink in. Get disturbed with inaction and take uncomfortable, imperfect action today. Not next week. Not when it feels right. Now. If someone would have told me in my 20s, maybe even in my 30s, that being a part of a group or being a part of a mastermind where everybody's getting smarter is the fastest way to your next level, I would have said, whatever, I don't even know what that is. I, I don't understand it. The only way I can learn is by getting out there and doing it through my own trial and error. And wasn't I a fool? Listen, 
you are here because you want another level of success. And if I wasn't completely transparent with you, if I didn't open your mind up to new ways to gain knowledge, wisdom, and capabilities, if I didn't share my own stories, my own evolution, that I'd be doing a massive disservice to you. I, I'm gonna let you in on a little secret. I did not read one book in my 20s, not one. I had dyslexia in school. When I tried to read, I was so embarrassed. It, it kind of, it, it pushed me away from reading. I thought reading was bad. And here's the thing, I made massive gains in my 20s. I went from completely broke, no money, credit card debt, uh, no college education, to being a millionaire in my 20s, documented, or else I, I wouldn't share it here. And I did that by my own trial and error. I did it by massive amounts of failure, massive amounts of doing it wrong, massive amounts of stress, insane amounts of time uh, obsessing and worrying and thinking and losing sleep over it. Yes, I powered my way through it. I had grit. But what I wasn't smart enough to realize and what I want to share with you is I was a fool. Contrary to that, I have a 18 year old kid that works for me, his name is Ryan, that I mentor and I teach and he's a part of Masterminds and he is gaining the collective wisdom of people who have already experienced what he wants to do. So if I was gonna boil down what a mastermind is, a mastermind is different than a live event where someone's at the front of the room pitching to you or sharing with you or teaching you. I've been to countless live events, they're amazing, they're game changers. But a mastermind is a, is a brainstorm. A mastermind is, think of collective wisdom in a room. So, let's say you wanted to learn how to write a book and sell it on social media. Now, you can look at all the other ads, read books about it, go out, write your book, and try to sell it. Amazing, much better than just writing it and guessing it. If you model other people, wonderful. If you read a book on it, wonderful. How much better would that be if you went to a live event and someone was up on stage and they gave a 60 minute presentation on how they took an idea in their head and then turned it into a book and then turned it into marketing and sold a lot. That's another level, right? Pages and pages of notes. But now let's talk about a mastermind. What if you were in a mastermind with 20 other people who have already written books that were successful on social media and you got to be in that collective wisdom, in that collective uh, uh, consciousness of success. Meaning, you get to learn from each of their, when I say collective, you could say, have one person say, wow, it took me about a year to write the book. And someone says, oh my God, I know, it used to take me a year to write a book, but here's what I do. I get my phone out, and I just go through the voice memo, and I come up with chapter heads, and then when I'm in the mood, even when I'm in the car driving, I just hit record, and I record the whole chapter. And then I take it and I forward it to Rev. They're a transcription service that's really cheap, really inexpensive, and they have it back in like five hours. Then when that gets back, I just edit my own words and oh my God, I had a chapter done. So I did that 12 times, I had my 12 chapters and the book was done. And you're like, oh my God, that just saved me a year. Okay, give me that information on how to write it. And then someone else goes, yeah, I did something similar when I got my book done. It took me about six months to get momentum to sell it on, on Facebook. And someone else goes, oh, whoa, whoa, wait a minute. When I got done, I thought the same thing. But what I did is I started making one minute hook videos on Instagram. And what I did is, in those one minutes, I would deliver a massive amount of value in the beginning. I'd say, hey, here's a secret that you need if you want to lose weight, go faster, make more money, be healthier, have a better relationship. Here's one secret. Hey, if you'd like more of those secrets, click the link on this page and get my book. And you go, wow, you, how many books did you sell on Instagram like that with those one minute power messages? 10,000. Oh my God, can I have that idea? Yes. Now, I'm exaggerating here, but do you see how masterminding, how brainstorming with the collective wisdom in the room, all of a sudden you get years and years and years of experience all by the people who have been there or done or even failed at what you want. Here's the greatest thing about being around people when they go, yeah, I'm gonna write this book and I'm gonna sell it for $25 on Facebook. Somebody says, um, I tried it on Facebook for 25, for some reason you can't get momentum. I tried it every way to Sunday, got the best marketing people on the planet. But here's what I did learn. If you sell it for under 19 
and then you have a customer funnel, you over deliver so much on the book that people come back and buy more products from you, it's okay to lose money on the front because they'll love you because you wrote such a good book, they'll come back and buy more of your products and you'll still be more cash flow positive and you can impact the world, get your book out to people instead of try to ask so much on the front. That might have taken him five years or her five years to figure out, you know how quick you get it? Just like that. So why am I obsessing on this for you? Because I wish someone would have told me the power of masterminding. If we can shift and realize that the definition of success is going from failure to failure without losing our enthusiasm, then all of a sudden we just want to fail as fast as we can to get it out of the way. And here's what I believe. I believe with all of me, and I share this a lot because it's so important, is that we all have to pay success tax. And the tax is the failures and overcoming them. We have to pretend there's an auditor up in the space, in sky, in heaven, whatever you want to believe, and they're watching our failures. They watched my daughter fail at that game. She's only going to get good when they go, yep, check, she had that bad game, she didn't give up. Uh, check, she wanted to come out of the game, she wouldn't lend, she didn't argue with her coach. Check, 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 check. And then success follows. If you want to if you want to play in a band, you would, you would be so excited to be able to play in front of 50,000 people, a packed stadium, all singing your songs, jamming in front of everybody. But you don't get to do that unless you work hard when no one's watching. You get everybody watching and eyeballs to win the game or play the concert or make the money. That only happens because you play when no one's watching and usually you fail miserably. You have to pay the success tax. You have to, if you're out there jamming in front of 50,000 people, I'd bet to say you showed up at a gig many times where no one showed up. Absolute failure. But you still got up the next day and practice. Same thing in your life. We want more money. We want more freedom. We want more choices. But most people aren't, aren't willing to go through the failures, aren't willing to take that research and development that knowledge that we get from failures, learn what not to do, what to do, let the rest pass, and then continue with enthusiasm to your next venture. The quote for me that makes the biggest impact, the definition of success by Winston Churchill is going from failure to failure without losing your enthusiasm. That's the definition of life. Know that those failures are just fine tuning your ax. They're sharpening your pick. They're allowing you to go faster and quicker by learning from your mistakes and learning what's right. And the most successful people I know know how to rebound fast, learn from those experiences, and keep pushing forward. Transform heartbreak into your leverage. Hmm. So as an underdog, your parents or your friends may not have faith in you or support you. And that's heartbreaking. Did you ever have a just like you watch me one day, you read my book or somebody else or you saw something online or you got involved in my real estate course and you're like, damn, I'm doing this. And you're, 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 you're using the power of you can't. You don't even know you are. You're, 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 you're being innovative. You're enthusiastic. And you go tell the person you care about the most and they shut you down like a lid, just like, like shutting off the light switch. Like, oh, that's so dumb. This is the wrong time. You don't have the money. And they shut you down. That's heartbreaking. Also, I've watched so many people when they have a desire for more. If you're watching me, you're someone who's working on your personal growth. You're working on your success. You want another level of life. You realize one of the biggest plights of our world is living knowing you have untapped potential. It's the worst feeling in the world. You know you got more gas in the tank, but you're not putting the throttle down because people are telling you and you can't. I just told my daughter, I stole this from Sean Stevenson, my, the three foot giant, my dear friend. He said, don't anyone, don't ever let anyone dim your glow so you can match them. You're bright. Be like, nah, nah, nah. And a lot of times we turn down our light so we can match that. Screw that. Brighten yours up more. Have you ever been in a relationship? Could be family, friends, partnership, or significant other. You're in a relationship. You, because you're here, there's a million other things you could be doing. You're here with me. You're working on your personal growth. You are. Your success, abundance. You want to tap into that next level, not leave it. Don't die at 98 years old and go, wow, I had a lot more to give the world, but I didn't. Oh my God, did you feel that? Screw that. I want to be like, hey, nothing left. I'm done. Time to go. Nothing left. But think about this. You're working on your personal growth. You start with somebody here. They are at this level, but they decide this is a perfect level for them. And all of a sudden, you're continuing to work on your personal growth and you're going higher 
and you're going higher. And now they're saying, oh, stop, you're getting all foo-foo. Oh, you're too, oh my God, what are you going to go to a Tony Robbins event and jump up and down? You're going to go to a Dean Graziosi growth event and blah, blah, blah. And all of a sudden you're going and on going and going and you get to a point and they're like, oh my God, we've grown apart. And somebody leaves you or someone calls you, tells you that you're a dreamer or you're no good. I've watched it happen so many times with people who desire another level of life because the people around you want to stay status quo and you make them uncomfortable. So heartbreak is pretty high in this world, in this world of growing, of going to the next level. And that's okay because that's the way it's supposed to be. I believe God, the universe, whatever, believe, designed it that way because they're meant to be with these people and you're meant to be with us. It doesn't mean you have to hurt anybody along the way, but there's a lot of heartache. There's a lot of heartbreak. So what I noticed with underdogs who spin it into a win is they take that heartbreak from any area, from parents, from a, a relationship, from a marriage to a bad partnership. They take that heartbreak and they ball it back up, poof, and use it as energy. You have a dream, you have a desire, and when you're a certain age, you stop that dream. Maybe you got serious about a job and people put their arm around you and said, you're finally growing up. I appreciate your responsibility. Really? I just threw my dreams in the toilet and you want to say you're proud of me, but it anchored that in. Oh, that's the right thing. My parents, my friends, my teachers. One more time. Screw that. They did it because they thought they were caring and loving you and that's not it. You have to push past the fear. Listen, I don't, I don't like to always use me as an example. But let me just share Matt Larson, my top real estate students. Didn't go to college. Got, actually got thrown out of college. Tried one semester. They threw him out. Didn't have any money. Grew up on a farm that not his farm, his father managed another farm in a little tiny rented uh, place, worked on a farm, went to be a machine shop worker, worked 70 hours a week in a machine shop, lived in a 300 square foot apartment, did all the stuff I'm telling you, got my courses, spent a lot of money on his education, and his family came to him and said, are you crazy? Real estate's for rich people, you'll never be able to do it. His girlfriend broke up with him because he spent lots of money on the education, and said, you're a dreamer. And he was re he called us to literally give everything back. And we said, did you even try? He's like, no, but, 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 but. All stories, all fear. All we said is, please go try it. That was like 3,500 real estate deals ago. Millions of dollars generated, lives changed. He's a partner of mine, he's a great dude. He went to a whole nother level. He employs 70 people. Do you know what almost killed him? Was the fear of believing all the shit. For lack of a better word, he was told all those years. It wasn't the real estate skills. It wasn't the real estate market. It didn't mean that he, it wasn't because he didn't go to college and he didn't have money or was, he was in too small of a town or too big of a city or too hot of a market or there's no good deals or bandit signs don't work. It had nothing to do with that. He almost quit because of the fear of breaking through, of listening to all the crap. What about you? Anything like that close ever happened to you? Of course it has. You might be thinking it right now. Dean, you want me to write down what I'm good at? You want me to write down what I like to do? That's not going to make me money. That's not true. Completely not true. I, I, was, I had dyslexia. I barely got out of high school. I was a car mechanic in my 20s. Every day, greasy hands and painting cars and sucking in fumes. If somebody would have said, yeah, that car mechanic in there that's all dirty with his uh, mechanic outfit on, he's going to write multiple New York Times best-selling books. He's going to be best friends with Tony Robbins and Richard Branson. He's going to touch the lives of millions of people. You say, that guy? No, wait a minute. Wait. You're talking that guy over there. The one sucking paint fumes, painting the side of the car. Never. Right? So don't tell me wherever you are, you can't go to where you want to go. I'm giving you the keys. I'm giving you the principles. I wish, I wish, I wish, I wish someone would have told me this stuff earlier on. It doesn't matter if you're 20, 40, 60, 80, or 90. Today's the day you could start. Today's the day you could break through that fear. Today's the day you can realize what my vision is and how I can start saying no to stuff so I can work on my unique ability, so I can go to that next level. Don't get consumed by the busy work. Don't lie to yourself. Everyone, right here, come on, look in my eyes. Stop lying to yourself. We all do. I'm not calling you out without calling myself out. I lie to myself. I, I'm like, well, I was busy. I had to do this and then do that and do that. All it was was my subconscious doing busy work so I didn't have to dig into the hard work that actually moves the needle and can take me to a place of solution, resolution, and next level. So really identify what are you doing that's busy work and what are you doing that can actually move the needle to make you a better version of you, to create new revenue, to get the company going, to anchor in new success habits that actually shift your thinking so you can focus on what's right. How do you become the role model? How do you become the leader? That's that's how you get your butt off the couch. That's how you stop procrastinating.
falling back into those beliefs, one thing, and I, I, didn't, I didn't have this strategy then, but now that I look back, what happened is when I started to narrow it down, and this is the part I want all of you to hear, as you narrow down your niche and what you're going to teach, your confidence goes up and your ability for success goes up. We think bigger is better. It's not. In this case, the smaller the better. The smaller the niche, the smaller the thing you're going to teach, your confidence will explode and the ability to impact the exact people is so much greater, right? So what I was thinking is 7 billion people, that seems overwhelming. But then I said, well, you know, for what I was teaching, I, I could only teach people in America. So that gets a lot smaller. Okay. So now it's not 7 billion people. It's 300 million people in America. But I don't want to teach everybody in America. I only want to teach people that want to be in the car business maybe. That gets way smaller. It's like not the car business because what I thought about, I, I can't teach anybody with a new car dealership. I don't know how to do the financing and work with Ford or General Motors or Honda. I don't know any of that. Oh my God, that's people way over my head, way different. So it's not just people in America and the car dealership. It's the used car industry. So I want to help people in the used car industry. But then I started thinking, it's like, I, I can't help people that's got, that have like 10 dealerships or have sold thousands of cars. That's not me. I'd be a phony. I can't teach that. I just want to teach people how to sell use cars and just do a few to supplement their income. And all of a sudden it's getting smaller. And I started thinking, okay, I can do that. I could teach the first person, somebody to do their first car, maybe do one a month and supplement their income because I know how to do this. But then I realized when I was really broke and didn't have money, I came up with one unique strategy that really helped my life. That took the niche all the way down to this little tiny dot. It was that dot right there. So I went from 7 billion people to people in America, to the car industry, to the used car industry, all the way down to the tiny dot of just helping people make a little bit of extra money by using this strategy to flip cars and some stress. And when I did, oh my God, when I did, everything changed. When I did that, my confidence went through the roof. When I did that, I didn't feel like I was an imposter anymore. I knew that if I had new people in a room if I could get people to read my course, they just want to make a little extra money who weren't in the car business, not in the new car business. Oh my God. Then I sat down every morning and I was writing for that person. You guys feel that? I was talking to that person. I was writing headlines for that person. I was creating chapters and exercise for the new person. If someone was in the car business for 20 years, they probably would have laughed at my course, but that's not who I marketed to. And when I did, here's the crazy part. I got done with the course. I was obsessing on the logos and the pieces. And I did, I had to do an infomercial. And the crazy part is I had no clue. I had no money. I didn't know where to start. Um, but that infomercial shifted my life. All of those things were happening. But when I narrowed it down, when I knew Tony Robbins served and shifted my life, when I knew there was people out there that could do a few cars a month or one a month or a few a year to supplement their life, I knew I must. I want you to look at things this way because there's two ways to look at this unique ability circle. Is as entrepreneurs, consider yourself an entrepreneur or not, you're somebody seeking another level. John Baptiste in 1790 coined the frame, phrase uh, entrepreneur by saying, someone who takes one level of productivity to another. You want to take your income, your life, your health, your happiness, your joy to another level. To me, entrepreneur. I think, I think sometimes with that's uh, in today's world, for some reason, it gives it a bad name. Like, that's why sometimes you feel lonely. It's like, no, I don't want to do what everybody else does. I want to go after my dreams, my goals. I want to be in control of my life. If that's a bad thing, then I'll be on the bad list. But here's what Dan Sullivan, how he teaches this. As entrepreneurs, as success seekers, we've said yes to everything to get here. So we say yes to the things we suck at. We say things that we're okay at, that we're good at, excellent at. And sometimes we spend some time in our unique ability. In your unique ability, you make $1,000 an hour. Is that possible? Of course it is. I'm going to use real estate as an example. In your unique ability, if it's finding deals other people can't, and then finding buyers, Buyers are easy to find, but finding deals and you find a wholesale deal that takes you five hours total and you make five grand. 
Could you make a thousand bucks an hour? Absolutely. So let me just use that as a realistic number. That's in real estate. Doesn't matter what you're doing, what business you're in. Let's, you know, and if you're working for someone else, making a thousand bucks an hour might be an impossible thing. I know that. I'm just using this for reference. But think about what you do for a living, what you're good at, what you like, what could cut you the biggest check. If you were just focused in that, when I'm writing a book, with as many books as it sell, when I'm writing my book, I know I'm making a thousand bucks an hour or whatever that number is, right? So let's just say in your unique ability, you make a thousand bucks an hour. And, and this, the things you suck at don't make you anything, but let's just say $10 an hour. Okay. So for me, writing, teaching, educating, flipping, real estate, creating a new information product, those things, that's where I'm in my unique ability. When I'm training with you right now, this fires me up, gives me enthusiasm. That's what I love to do. Uh, down here, trying to edit my own slides trying to edit my book. I write a long email and I try to edit it and I'm doing this, I'm wasting my time. Trying to create an Excel spreadsheet, trying to work on technology, trying to figure out everything on my cell phone. I don't know it all. I, I, I get one of my assistants to show me how to do things. Set up Siri at my house so I can listen to music. It overwhelms me, I get like, Ugh! I used to think oh, I should know that, I should be smarter. Now it's like, nope, I'm not gonna do I have a house concierge. I'm, this sounds like I'm bragging. But what I've come to realize, if I work in my unique ability, everything below this becomes an ROI, a return on investment. So let's just say this is $100 an hour or a day or whatever the number is, right? Let's just say it's $100 an hour or $5, $20 an hour, $100, you know, whatever the number is here for you. But let's just say things you suck at is 10. Let's just say this is 20. Let's just say this is 40 dollars an hour. Let's say the things you're excellent at are 50 or a hundred dollars an hour you could be making. What Dan's whole point is, and you can look at this in a different, many different ways, lower in complexity or whatever. Dan's whole thing is when you peel the onion back and you get to where you can live in here, what you're good at or you like and the biggest check, right? And the biggest check, all of these become an ROI. Why would you do stuff at 10 bucks an hour when you can live here and pay that person? Or why would you even do stuff you're good at or excellent at or, or excellent at when it becomes an ROI? And I want you to, this is not anything that's going to happen today. I'm not saying you're going to do this today, but I want you to think about this because most people don't. Entrepreneurs are lonely. Entrepreneurs think differently than everybody. We make money different than everybody. We are, you're sitting here watching me. There's a million other things you could be doing this morning. Some of you might be at work sneaking this. I know it's the middle of the day. But you're here, you do things different than everybody else. You gotta start thinking differently. This isn't corporate structure. This isn't trying to evolve through the ranks. This is thinking in a creative way, outside the box, tap into your unique ability, tap into your own enthusiasm and authenticity, and think a little bit differently than everyone else. Would you care if your friends went to the movies and they didn't invite you? Would you care if someone was rude to you? Would you care if someone cut you off in traffic? How would you be to people around you? If it was rainy, would you say, it's a rainy day, or would you say, oh my God, look at the abundance of this amazing rain. If a mosquito bit you, would it bug you? If you had a week left to live, you'd be like, oh my God, that little thing just kicked my ass. <laughs> and then I think about, and this is from the untethered soul, if, if a higher power, whoever you believe in, God came down and spent time with you, do you want to be the person that lets all those little things bug you, that lets, gets the angst, gets the gets in the, you know, suffers? Or would you want to be the person that just is in a living an abundant mindset, an abundant life? And I would love for you guys to take a few moments and not think of the bucket list stuff, but think of the things you would change immediately. What would you do if a really sweet, pleasant angel came down to deliver you the bad news that you had a week left to live? I think so much would change. I mean, there might be some bucket list stuff, but I know throughout a day, when I, when I think through that framing, nothing gets me off, especially in the last six months. Nothing gets me off track. Nothing gets me to be angst. And, and I have to tell you, I, I'm always high energy. I, I was always running away from my past and being homeless as a kid and couldn't read well and getting made fun of. Like I was always running from that. I always felt I had to run 100 miles an hour and I had to work all night and I could take on the stress. Something goes wrong with the business, give it to me. Something's wrong, there's a conflict, give it to me, I'll fix it, give it to me. And I'd hold it and I'd still, I'd walk around with a smile on the outside, but I knew there was this burning hole of anxiety and stress and worry about going backwards. And I thought for so many years that was my driving force. I don't want to go backwards. I'm scared. I don't, I have this anxiety, but I can power through. 
And once I let that go, I, I was afraid to let it go, thinking that was my power, that was my superhero. That was, that's what drove me, and it was a lie. You can accomplish just as much with zero suffering. Think of what we do in life as mapping out new terrain, right? So think of, the, think of our life as like the earth, and we're explorers, right? And some people take one path. They go to work every day, they do the same thing, same couple of friends, they do, and, that's, and they're okay with this one straight line path. They don't see any of the world. They just, they do this, they go do their thing, and they come back. That's one version. And then there's some people who say, this, this path that everybody says is great, this path that everybody like, says, this is the security, this is the safety, this is how life is supposed to be, it's like, screw that. And they wander off the path, right? If you're here with us today, you're here with me today, you're part of the inner circle, um, that means that you're someone who's wandered off the path. Congratulations, the path sucks. The path is what everybody else does. The path that, and if, you're, if somebody's on it and they're miserable, they want you to be on the path with them when they see you straying, like, no, 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 get back on here. It's not safe out there. No, it's not safe on the path. We have one life. We gotta squeeze every bit of juice out of this life. You don't wanna look back at the end of your life, being 100 years old, being in the hospital, and go, wow, I walked the same path every day. I'm so glad I played it safe. No, screw that. No one says that. At the end, you're like, why didn't I step off the path? Why didn't I go for more? Why didn't I tap into my, why didn't I go after being an artist, go after real estate investing, go after doing my own online business, go after the fitness world, go in the coaching world, go sing? Why, why didn't I do it? Because someone told you staying on the path was smart. Screw that, get off the path. But if you think about that, and you're mapping out terrain, so th just think if we're explorers, if we're on the path, we get to explore a new territory. And I'm gonna read some of these guys. Um, we get to explore a new territory. But when you explore new territory, you've kind of mapped out that terrain. Now, if you go off the path and you find a cliff, you can mark that. If you find paradise, you could mark that. If you find water, you mark that. You find mountains, you mark that. You find the ocean, you mark it. And all of a sudden you start exploring. For me, going through this process, I mapped out a whole new bunch of terrain. I mapped out, I mapped, listen, can I tell you something? I feel, absolutely positively bulletproof because I face the biggest fear of my life. There's nothing that can get me. Let me just tell you something. I drive down the road and somebody cuts me off, I wave to them. I order chicken for dinner, they bring me steak, well done. I eat the steak well done and say thank you because the little doesn't matter anymore. If you, if you want another level of life, get bigger problems and solve bigger problems. Literally solve bigger problems and watch your life go to another level. Watch the little fall away. The stuff that used to bug you, be like, why did I let that bug me? Get a deeper set of problems and solve that shit. And when you're done with that, solve the next one. And when you're done with that, solve the next one. Instead of solving $100 problems, you know what my wish for you is? Solve million dollar problems. They're the same amount of stress. If you need 100 bucks to pay the bill or you need a million, I assure you it's the same stress. So why not add more zeros? If you know the product you have, the service you have, the love that you have, the person you are, if you know it's authentic, it's real, it's the best on the planet, then you have to do everything in your power to get people to take action. I say this all the time, but the movie Field of Dreams with Kevin Costner years ago, they said, if you build it, they will come. They won't come, they just won't. There's outliers that every once in a while somebody builds something and it goes viral. But most of the time when you see a product that's working, you see someone who's evolving through a company, has a great relationship, it's because they know how to be persuasive, they know how to sell. But I want to teach you two things today. There are emotional buyers and there are logical buyers. And if you are just attracting one or the other, then you're doing everyone a disservice. So think about an emotional purchase. Uh, if you ever watched an infomercial, if you ever bought that tiny little hose that is like this big, it's a tiny, you know, it can fit in your hand, and when you plug it in and you turn the, you screw it on, you turn the water on, it gets 50 feet long, right? When you see something like that, an emotional, you make an emotional decision. You got two minutes, like that hose looks great, and you buy it. That's an that's an extreme example, and maybe it sits in your garage and never use it. I guarantee there are things in your life you bought making an emotional decision. That's okay. We need emotions to move us forward. So some people are not, I don't want to say this in a bad way, but some people are irrational buyers. I'm an irrational buyer. 
from the top looking down, when I see something I like, if I go buy a new car, if I walk on the dealership, I see the car I like, I wanna leave there in 25 minutes with that car. I'm irrational, I'm emotional. If I'm, if I'm watching a video online or I'm at a live event and I see something I like, there's zero, I'm not waiting to research. My heart tells me it's good, my gut instinct tells me I'm good, I'm buying it. So I am an emotional, irrational buyer, but that's only a small percent of the world. Then I'm on the extreme of, I'll do it right now, I make quick decisions. On the complete other extreme are buyers who have to be extremely logical. That means, uh, if this sounds good, this car looks good, but I'm gonna go home, I'm gonna research it, I'm gonna ask anybody I know if they have a car like that, I'm gonna go check the rating, I'm gonna see how many miles per gallon it gets, I'm gonna see if there's any flaws, is there any recalls, and some people will, will just do that logical searching all the way, so that's the extreme. So what I wanna share with you today is when you're selling anything, when you're persuading someone, it doesn't matter, again, if it's getting a promotion from your boss, it's making more money, it's uh, selling your product or service, I want you to think of a of attracting and fulfilling both of them. You need to get people emotional. They don't, people don't make decisions without being emotional, be connected, feel moved, have a feeling inside. But then if you cover the logical part, for those of that wanna overthink, then you can really compound and exponentially grow your sales. So for example, this past weekend I was at an event and I spoke on stage and I offered a $16,000 mastermind, incredible training, worth every dime. There were the irrational, emotional buyers like me who took action immediately. I would have taken action halfway through the presentation. But then there were some people who waited until the second day. And some people that are very logical waited until the third day, last minute, right before they walked out the door. And the sales were about equal, the emotional and the logical. But here's the thing I want you to be careful of. In your own life, Make sure you don't get so logical and need every I dotted and every T crossed that you never make a decision. You never pull the trigger. Every year, like, I'm gonna, I should've, I would've. It's because you're, you're, you probably have beliefs from parents, beliefs from teachers that you need to research, that you need to look before you leave. I have the, I have the thoughts of jump out of the plane, grow wings on the way down, because he who hesitates loses. So two things I wanna share. If you're selling, if you wanna fuel your company, your life, you wanna persuade people. Remember, some people make emotional, some people make logical decisions. Merge the two together, sales will increase. In your own life, don't get so logical that you missed out on amazing opportunities. I remember in my own life when I started getting success, I was working my guts out. I was, I was working on cars during the day, I was working at real estate at night, and then then before when before I did my first like education course, I was doing cars during the day, real estate at night, and setting the alarm at five in the morning. From five to like nine in the morning, I'd work on trying to figure out how to write a course on how to do what I did in my life and how to be successful. I was so confused. I did all that, and guess what? I did that for years. For years, I, I'm just being honest. I put in lots and lots of hours. I had fun. I enjoyed myself. I played hard too, but I put in a lot of time. But then when it finally hit and I got a little momentum, do you know I heard a lot of my friends say, oh, you lucky. Like, I, in fact, I had a joke for a while. It made me think I had a joke for a while that when I try something new that's out of the norm, which most people wouldn't try, people either say, oh, you, Dean got lucky, you lucky. Or if I tried and failed, it's like, I knew that idiot wouldn't make it. There's nothing in between. And you know what? Awesome. Screw it. I don't care. I don't dislike my friends who said all that stuff. I'm still friends with them. Some of them since fifth grade but they're gonna look through life through a lens of they're satisfied with okay. They're satisfied making okay money. They're satisfied with okay relationship. They're satisfied with being an okay parent. They're satisfied with an okay career that doesn't light them up. Screw that, I'm not satisfied with it. I'd rather fail miserably. If I look back on my deathbed, would you, uh, you too, let me ask you, would you let them look back on your deathbed and be like, hey, you know what? Played it safe, didn't go after anything, but you know, I lived an okay life that. Excuse my language. I, it just, I felt like saying it and I said it. And if you have someone younger, listen, I'm sorry, I feel bad now, but that's the emotion I feel. And if you're listening to me, if you're listening to my podcast, then you feel the same way. People will buy from you and learn from you when they feel understood, not when they understand you. Do you hear that? That's one of the biggest secrets to my success. People will buy from you, do business from you, with you, learn from you when they feel understood, not when they understand you. Most people want to just 
vomit up all their experience, vomit up on how good they are, vomit up on how great their product is, and you don't even know what the person on the other side is thinking. Think about that with salesmen. Would you, do you like a pushy salesman when you go to buy a car that comes out and says, I've been doing this for 30 years, I got this, I got this experience, this little baby would be perfect for you. It's fast, it's quick, it's, it's a two-seater, it's this, 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 and he doesn't realize you showed up because you want an SUV because you have four kids. Like, wouldn't it have been better if you just walked out and said, hey man, out looking for a car, what's up with your family? What do you got going on? And just listened. People buy from you when they feel understood, when there's a connection. I just was having this girl, uh, conversation with my girlfriend Lisa on the way here. And we were talking about uh, the things that drive you and the things mm. that, um, that want to be, uh, you know, it's funny you say, like I, I have so many different emotions at once. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but she comes from an amazing family, mm. just like you said your wife did. Yeah. Like amazing. She has, yeah. there's five siblings, their parents are together. They, they're on a text string every day. They all talk every day. Like her phone's always blowing up and going off and it's always inspirational and they're, they all support each other. One just lost their job and their whole family's like, well, I'll get together and we'll, it's finally time you start your own business anyway and I'll build the website, I'll give you the money. Like it's unbelievable what they do. And I love both my parents. My mom and dad are amazing, but I didn't have that. They split at three. Uh, I was three when they split and I lived with mom and then dad and Graham and they moved, you know, I moved 20 times by the time I was 19. Right, so it was all this insecurity. So, but again, that was my journey, it made me the man I am. So for me, one of the things is that I don't have something to refer to, to be a good dad. Mm. My father's father was physically abused all the kids. Mm. They were, some of them were sexually abused. Mm. And his father did that, I think, I look at this long lineage of screwed up grazioses, mm. and I knew it was gonna stop with me. Mm. Like, my sister did it, she's an amazing mother. Uh, actually, my nephew works for me. Incredible kids, like the greatest kids you ever met. She stopped it, mm. and I wanna do the same thing. So, I'm always in, like uh, you and I, when we talk later, we'll probably just talk about being a parent, because yeah. I love interviewing and talking to other great parents, because mm. I wanna learn, because I don't have a blueprint. Like I said, Lisa, she's got the blueprint. She yeah, grew up she in it, from it, right? So, for me, I wanna be a better man, mm. and always wanna continue to grow, so I can set an example and change mm. uh, the way my kids see life and experience mm -hmm. life. I don't want to raise entitled brats. That's the last thing this world needs. Yeah. Um, I want them to have hunger and drive and be good people. And, and one thing I'll share with you, um, a dear friend of mine, uh, he's about 15 years older than me. He said to me, um, and he's done extremely well, just uh, extremely well. And he said, I think at the end of our lives, when you're on your deathbed, I don't think we'll ask any other question because you're a parent like me. He says, you're a dad like me, I could see it. Because I think the question we're gonna ask ourselves is did we do everything we could to give our kids the, the tools to live a fulfilled life? Mm. I said, I mean, because I don't think anything, you won't say how many women did I sleep with, how much money did I make, how many buildings did I buy? It'll be like, wow, did I give the kids? Mm. And I said, he said, you'll be able to go off to the next place. If you could say yes, you did your best. He goes, but what if you can't say that? Mm. Jeez. And for me, it's like, Whew. that's all I think about. It's like, too. that's one of the things. I, I can't be the perfect, I try, I do everything I can to be a great dad just like you. Yeah. But fundamentally, I want to give them the tools to be thriving me adults. Too. Me too. And that's just one, I mean, yes, yeah. but that, I could talk about that. I want to go conquer something right now thinking about yeah. that. Listen, when I was working out of that garage, if someone would have come to me and said, hey, just want to let you know, Someday you're gonna be a multiple New York Times bestselling author. Someday your brands and your company is gonna break a billion dollars in sales. Someday you're gonna be a dad with two amazing kids and you're gonna coach literally coach softball. Someday you're gonna be able to jump on private planes and fly and go to the best fishing resort in the world with your kids for one day to have the time of your life. I'm only referencing that because we did it about two weeks ago. I'm not saying that to brag, but that kid, I'm holding up this picture again where you could laugh if you're watching this. That kid, that scared, embarrassed, broke kid had a vision for more in his life and he made it. If you would have told me that at that age, I would have said, no way in I hope I can make 1500 bucks a week someday and not have to struggle and hump it. But that was my journey. What is yours? What if every single thing in your life was designed for you as a test to see if you really have the grit, the courage, the, 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 the the, the dedication to be the best version of you. And if you pass the test, you get to live the life that you deserve. Not my life, not some silly person you follow on Instagram showing all these pictures and stuff. I'm talking about being the best version of you. There is a next level waiting inside of you. Realize that life is just putting all these things in your place, in your way to test you. 
pass the test, go to the next level, live the life you deserve. We've all been told that money doesn't grow on trees. And what that is, is we feel that money is scarce, or in fact, uh, we live in a fear that it's gonna run out or gonna vanish. And, and we know that money doesn't vanish. Money's not going away. There's the same amount of money, if not more, around the world than there's ever been. It's not getting smaller. Think about that, like really think what I just said. Money is not shrinking, right? In fact, this year in America alone, and I've said the stats, a lot of you have heard this, but because it boggles my mind, that there's 1,700 new millionaires being created every day in America. Think about that, 1,700 new millionaires every single day in America. Is that 80, doing the math? Uh, yeah, like every hour, every, every, I mean, it's crazy, right? So think about that. And, and I, I took some notes here. So instead of, instead of the question, and this is, this is one I really want you to think about, what happens is when we think about money is scarce and it doesn't go on trees and we have this feeling that it's getting shrinking and it's going away, what we ask ourselves is this, how do I protect myself? How do I save this money? How do I make sure no one takes what I have? And that mindset keeps you on the sidelines. I want you to say, what, what about asking yourself a different question? Because here's the thing, if money doesn't disappear, if we know it's the same amount or more, can we agree on that? If it's not disappearing, then all it is is money is moving from one group of people to another group of people. Same amount of money. If there's still, let's say there's $100 and you're moving it around amongst a bunch of people, it's just who's getting the chunk of it? There's still $100. The same sum total is there. It's just moving differently. So the question you should be asking yourself is not how do I hold on to what I have? How do I make sure I don't lose any of this? How do I make sure you know, I, I keep the lights off at night? I'm not saying you shouldn't be conservative. What I'm saying is instead of having that mindset, what we should be saying is how do I become the person and, and this is one, write this down. I hope, you, I hope you're paying attention here today, guys. I hope you're not playing with social media, looking around, try to focus on this, because the question should be, how do I become the person where the money is moving to rather than away from? Right, just the same little, same thought process, just a different shift. Instead of, instead of thinking money is scarce and it's going away, no, there's 1,700 new millionaires a day in America alone being created right now. Money's not getting scarce. It's just those people, money is flowing to them, and somebody else who's standing there trying to protect, the little, protect themselves and, and, and being, thinking in a scarce mindset, their money is slowly going away. Now, I am surely not gonna be an advocate or say that you shouldn't be conservative, that you shouldn't save money, that you shouldn't be smart with your money. Of course you should, but here's what I know in the evolution of my life of going from that kid living <laughs> in a bathroom with my dad and not having money and all those things, and I, I'm not saying that to give you my, 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 my pitch or my story, but when I look back at when I tried to save and be conservative because I listened to you know, maybe grandparents that went through the depression or listened to people that you know, was like, you're crazy. So what I realize is when you change your mindset on money, when you gain the capabilities, and when you take action, it is, in my opinion, you could disagree with me, in my opinion, money is easier to flow to you and make it than it is to save it. I even look at that in my business. I'll be like, hey, let's tighten up on expenses. And, and I'll look through all these things like, okay, if we tighten up all those because we're such a big company now, we could save this much. But if, we, if I write a new book, if I start a new campaign, if I do some more real estate deals, I can bring in this much with, a little, with the same amount of effort. Like, save this much or just make this much? How the hell it? Keep everybody there, keep the lights on. I'm gonna go make it over here. Now, I might be an extreme, but I'd like to give you a little bit of that. That if we stand on the sidelines envying those making more, being not jealous, but like desiring what other people have, but we're afraid because we wanna hold on to what we have and be afraid to take action. Do you want to know one of the biggest secrets to sales in our world today, right now, where I, I believe where we're at, is authenticity. People just want to know what's real, what's raw, and they want it from your heart. If you think about the people that you've connected with in your life, remember this phrase. People will buy from you, say yes to you, when they feel understood, not just when they understand you. Listen to that again. 
People will buy from you, say yes to you when they feel understood, not just when they understand you. Let's take, let's take an example, and then I'm going to circle back around with authenticity. So I'm going to park authenticity, put a pin in it, and come back to it. But think about this. Think about, let's just say the quintessential sales area is used cars or new cars. And I know that world is changing, but let's just talk about uh, the way it was for the last 100 years, 50 years. Saturday afternoon, you're car shopping, you pull into the dealership, there's 10 dealers waiting in the window, waiting for you to come in. You pull up, one of them gets a high five, your turn, go, go chat with the guy in the Tesla or whatever, right? Now think about this scenario. Same scenario, person comes up and says, hey, glad, for, glad you're here today. Nice Saturday, right? Hey, listen, I just wanted to let you know, I've been selling these cars for 27 years. I know them inside and out. I've been voted the top sales guy 14 months out of the last five years. Uh, and it's because I care about the client. This is what I do. And I can see you're here today and you'd love a, a sporty car, but well, let me guess, you want something that's a little good on the gas, maybe eco friendly so you can do your part. I got this amazing two seater, it's fast, it's eco friendly, it's this, it's that. Let's go take a look at it. Now that's a sales guy that could make a job for 27 years and he wants you to understand him. But what if you went there that day because you, are, you just had your third child and you want your wife to have something that's not a minivan, but the big SUVs are too clunky, and you're just looking for something in the middle, nothing even close. Now that same salesperson that wants you to understand him, what if there's a salesperson that comes out, and you see him walking over to you, and you're like, oh shit, here comes a sales guy. You roll down your window, or you get out, and he says, hey, listen, first off, I know it's a Saturday, we all work on commissions. Authenticity, transparency. We all work on commissions. It's my turn up. I gotta, I get you. But I just wanna tell you, let me just back up. I just wanna ask, why are you here today? What's your family like? What, uh, how can I serve you? Tell me a little bit about you. And all of a sudden the person says, wow. Immediately, who do you have rapport with immediately? Sales guy number two because he, wanted, he wants to, you to feel understood, and probably not on purpose, that's just who he is. All of a sudden you go, well, we had our third kid, and you go, oh my God, I'm on my fourth, I get it. My wife hated the minivan. When I thought about bringing it to her house, she was like, are you crazy? But then I looked at the monster Escalade, and she's, that's a bus. But we figured out something in between. W would you be open to something kind of in the middle? It's kind of like the sporty, uh, smaller SUV. All of a sudden you're laughing, high-fiving, talking about the names of your kids, what's going on in school, they're playing softball or baseball and what they do. And all of a sudden you're sitting in the car going, it's a good guy. And what did he do most of the time? He listened. He was authentic. He was transparent. I do things the way I want to do. I want to make my own rules. I don't want anybody to tell me how, what kind of husband I can be if I want to take off in the middle of the day and romance my wife because we have the most rela amazing relationship in the world. That might sound boring to you or that sounds, ugh, but that's me. I will fight for that. I will die for that. That is my why. Being a leader to my incredible team that's like my family. Learning and growing and help impact the world. Help unite us and lock arms so we can help shift the world. How do we change the global economy? By changing the economy in our homes. How do we change the global conversation? By changing the conversation in our homes. We are the change. We affect the change. No one's coming to fix it. To me, that's my why. I hope you can hear it. I hope you can feel it. It comes from my heart. So when I'm standing on one side of the ravine and I see where I want to go on the other, before I even know how I'm going to get in there, I know my why and I'm getting over there no matter what. If I got to get bloody, bruised up, fail, whatever it takes, I'm getting to the other side. Are you? Do you know the true reason why you're listening to this? Why you want another level? If you don't, go find it. I promise you when you find it, nothing will stop you. Not a brick wall, not a steel girder, not dirt, a mountain, nothing. A mountain won't stop you when you know your true why. You cannot create your compelling future until you decide what your painful future is. Because this will get you, this is, once you get around here, now all of a sudden, you're going up the loop. Like you projected, if I don't do crap, I'm going to be stuck right here. But now that I felt that way, 
What would be ideal? What would be ideal? What's a compelling future for you? For me, in my relationship, Tony, I'm gonna give my credit to my boy, Tony. I've done all these things before, but he made me do it in front of him. He made me go in the other room and do it. I took a piece of paper when it comes to relationships. I made a line down the middle, and I put on the left side what was an absolute must in the next relationship I have. And on the right side, I put absolute unacceptable. And I literally wrote down things that, in my, I'm just being honest, I, I wrote down everything. I wrote down someone that loves my children. I know this would be hard. Someone who will love my children as if they're own. Someone who works on their personal growth. Someone who's a go-getter. Someone who knows that we're flawed and we're all trying to get better. I just wrote down all these things that I was looking for. Seemed like it was too good to be true. And I put what was not acceptable. Someone who doesn't have a big heart. Someone who won't accept my children. Someone who wants to fight with my ex or fight with other people. Someone who likes confrontation. I won't accept anyone who doesn't you know, want to work on their health and their growth. I wrote all this stuff down. It seemed crazy. It was my compelling future. I stared at it and I looked at it and I felt so good and it gave me my true north. I projected being alone and, and staying the way I was and I also wrote down a compelling future. I write down a compelling future in my business all the time. Remember what I said about that Indian proverb, a man with his health has a million wishes and a man with, without his health has but one. I don't care how successful you get, how much money you make, how much love you have in your life. Without health, we have anything. We have nothing. And I see it, just this little inconvenience. Imagine when you're, if your health is stripped away. If you're, if you're going through something in, in the health world, I'm sorry. I send you my love, my prayers, my empathy. And if you're not, don't take it for granted. Without our health, life, nothing else matters. So get up, make better decisions this week to eat, make better decisions on sleep, make better decisions on exercise. We only have one body. Whether you believe in God, the universe, whatever you believe in, we were given this one body, this one unique DNA, this one chance to thrive. Make all the money in the world, find all the abundance, happiness, and joy, but take care of you along the way. Here's the thing, when you're going, if you're going through a really tough time right now, it's like, it's hard to go, oh, this is for me. I'm gonna be so much better. <laughs> it's be like, a blessing in 20 years. Yeah. yeah, it's like, no, you don't. But that process I told you, if you have to watch this video or listen to this audio again, that process is what I use today because my businesses and companies are thriving right now. My right. book just passed 600,000 copies. We're on fire. Like, man. we're, every part is going. Tony Robbins and I are launching a company. My buddy Brendan Bouchard and I own growth.com. That company is crushing. We have all these different things going on. But I'm not naive enough to think, Omar, I promise you, I'll be going through some kind of fest <laughs> in the next three to five years. It just happens. They right. change a regulation. Something goes wrong. A, a, a publisher that owes you money goes bankrupt. Like these things happen. Yeah, it's part of the business. Yeah. And the more you go through it, the more you're like, I got this. What's coming next? And the more you create a framework, I didn't have a framework. I looked back in retrospect, how did I get through all those things? And I did have a framework, now I know it. It's like, okay, something goes wrong. There was a situation in my life, I didn't plan it, okay? I gotta deal with it. I could stack the negative or I could stack the positive. I could focus on what goes wrong, focus on what go right. I could focus on who I wanna be or I don't wanna be. I can create my compelling future. I can go out and obsess and gain capabilities and then after I gain the capabilities, you gotta do the most important thing. You have to have courage. You have to jump out of the plane and grow wings on the way down. And that's the wow. hardest thing. If you are listening to this podcast, you're listening to other podcasts that motivate you, give you capabilities to go faster, quicker, make more money, have more freedom, control in your life, all those types of things. But none of it, listen to me, listen to this clearly, maybe for the first time in your life, really hear me. None of it is possible if your confidence is down. So I want you to think about the things in your life that steal your confidence. And remember, when I say steal your confidence, I don't mean that you have 100% of confidence and you do something and you go to 20% or 10%. I'm talking about when your confidence is off just 5%, do you make smart decisions? When your confidence is down, do you go after the business? Do you ask for the money? Do you start the, the website? Do you, do you uh, get the girl? Do you get the promotion? Do you ask your boss for a raise? Now when your confidence is down, you, that's when you start saying, well, maybe this is good enough. Maybe my relationship is good enough. I should just be happy with what I got. I should just be happy with the money I make. Screw that. If you were happy, you wouldn't be here. You'd be doing something else right now besides listening or watching me. So let's just face the facts. Where you are right now is not sufficient for you. Doesn't mean it's horrible, but it's not enough. 
And if you want to get to that next level, you need to protect your confidence by any shape, measure, or form, protect it. So what are the things that ding your confidence? I realized at an early, early time, it's probably been 10 years, that watching the news for me, when I watch the news and I see that it looks like the world is going to hell in a handbasket or what the president is saying today or what Congress is saying or you listen to the left or the right or or people in the middle, if you listen to all the gun violence and all, like all the news does for me is make me question where the world is going in my next level. So for 10 years now, I've been on a news diet. I don't watch the news. I have no clue what's going on, nor do I care. It was the biggest transformation in my life. I, where I want to spend my time, I want to spend time with my family, the people I love, my kids, my team members. They deserve the best of me. They don't deserve Dean at 95% confidence. They deserve 100%. And if I watch the news, it, it brings it down so I won't be the best team leader. I won't be the best father. I won't be the best man I can be. I won't be the best uh, inspiration for you. So screw the news. It dings my confidence. It's out. I've been on a news diet. I challenge you to do the same thing. For me, I don't know about you, but if, if you have your phone, I'm recording on my phone here, I'm stopped now, I can talk to you. Um, but I don't know, this is my wallet, but if you ever look at your phone, if it dings, someone texts you or calls you and you look at it and you go, oh, should I answer this now? Should I answer it later? To me, that robs my confidence. I don't want those people in my life. I either have to set boundaries or I have to push them out of my life. Listen, let's just be honest. Stop feeling bad for other people. Stop dimming your glow. Stop talking about your aspirational next level. Stop fantasizing about your dreams in front of people because it may insult them or make them feel inferior or they may tell you you're a dreamer. If that's the case, push them out of your life or become Teflon and don't listen to their I'm realizing year after year after year that I judged myself by an outdated scorecard. I judged myself that if I wasn't good at reading, I wasn't good in school, I didn't get good grades, and I didn't go to college, that I guess I was gonna be a loser. No, hell no. That young man has so much empathy, has so much drive. Screw math. Don't ever get good at math. In fact, never look at math again for the rest of your life. That's what we have calculators for. That's what we have accountants for. Screw that. If you're good at math, be an accountant. Run the books. But if you're not, find your passion. Get so good at something that you pay people to do the rest. I, listen, when I think about my, my fight, my mission, my drive, I want every single insecure person, I want every person who thinks they're bad at something, every person who's been told they're a loser, been told they're a dreamer, been told they're stupid, to show the world that they were wrong. They are wrong. My math te- my Mrs. Thompson, she treated me like in seventh grade. I remember passing her years later, later in a little Ford beat up Escort. Like, like I'm not saying money has to do with everything, but who was she to judge me? I'm not mad at her. In fact, I'm happy for her. She was part of the ingredient for the growth in my life. But Miss Thompson, later on in life, I found struggled all the time financially because she couldn't even get the regular teaching job. She had the, the she was in the, you know, helping me, the, the people with that struggled. And she was frustrated because she couldn't even get raised up to the job she wanted. So she was pissed. She took it out on me. She had an outdated scorecard. And she projected that on me. But what if I didn't change? What if I didn't find out that she was wrong and I was right? I've impacted more lives in a day than she has in her entire life. And I don't, I'm not being rude, but I'm just being honest. She was a frustrated teacher. I found out also she was left-handed where she went to school when she was a little girl because she was older. They thought left-handed was evil. They tied her left hand behind her back and made her right, right-handed. She was a frustrated teacher. And she almost ruined my dreams. Who are you letting ruin your dreams? What scorecard are you judging yourself by? Screw that. This is your time. This is your opportunity. This new world that we live in with access like you listening to me right now. I'm shooting this while I'm in my car because I'm going to a dentist appointment. But I had this on my heart. We have access to so much knowledge. We have access to information. There's more millionaires being made every day right now than ever before in history. This is your time. There's no better time. There's no different time. This is your time. But you're gonna, but the only way it'll happen is if you change the story in your head. If you say, I suck at math, I can never do this, I'm a loser. No, screw that. Never focus on math ever again. Maybe some people would tell you that my advice is bad. I'm sorry. It worked for me. 
It worked for every billionaire I've ever met, every multimillionaire I've ever met. I met presidents. I met. I spent time with Joel Osteen. I've spent time with Michael Jordan. All of them have the same stuff. So could they be wrong? And my grumpy, miserable, frustrated seventh grade teacher was right? I don't think so. Change the scorecard. Change your desires. Find your passion. Don't, when people tell you stop dreaming, tell them, I'm sorry you gave up on yours. I'm not quite there yet. That's the response you need to share. I've failed miserably in my life, but I've had massive success. I'm sharing this with you today so you can avoid the potholes, so you can avoid, avoid the pitfalls, so you can go faster to your next level. Why go through your own trial and error when I've been here? So do this exercise. Don't just think about it. Don't just be inspired. Do it this week. Start writing down everything in your life that makes you feel a little bit less than confident. Someone in your life, a relationship, watching the news, working on your weaknesses, uh, redundant work, negative people, wh whatever it is, start recognizing it and start eliminating those things in your life. Start figuring out how you could push them out or become Teflon or switch it or adjust it or go on a one week news diet. Just go this week without watching one bit of news and use that time that you'd watch the news or surf online looking at stupid crap that doesn't do anything for your life. Use that time working on you. Read a book. Read Powerful by Peggy McCall. Read Shoe Dog by Phil Knight. Read Principles by Ray Dalio. Read something that takes you forward and eliminate the crap that holds you back. How important is it for you to surround yourself with a growth mindset? Okay, when I say a growth mindset, it's being around books, people, environment, uh, videos that drive you, that push you, don't keep you back. You see, i give you an example. This morning, I got up at 4.45 and I went to the gym and I met my buddy, Trent Shelton. If you don't know Trent, you should follow him. He's an amazing guy, ex-NFL player, killed it for the Colts, and now he's killing it online, inspiring millions of people. His last video just went, uh, he put it up maybe two weeks ago. I saw it had 24 million views already. This guy's a player, one of the top influencers in the world. So this morning, he's in town. We both spoke at my buddy Brendan Bouchard's event uh, yesterday uh, and the day before. And he's in town. I said, hey, you want to work out at 5.30 at this new gym I go to? So he's like, oh, yeah. So he meets me there at 5.30. Now, Trent's in his 30s. Um, I'm two months away from 50. And the reason I share that is not to brag, but the truth is I stayed up kind of late last night and I was tired this morning. I've had this on and off cold. I think it's allergies, whatever. So I'm not feeling the best. So I got out of bed and I'm like, well, I'm meeting Trent. I, I, I'll just, you know, I'll do my best I can to to uh, get a decent workout in. Well, the trainer I have now, I haven't had a trainer in like three years. This guy's a monster. I mean, a monster as far as killing you, right? So I show up and Trent is so positive that we subliminally inspired each other to go to another level. We freaking killed it. I mean, he's an ex-NFL player in amazing shape. He's running a marathon in a couple months and I just didn't wanna be the older guy fallen behind. In fact, we were dead even on weight, on reps, on everything through this workout. And it was his growth mindset. It was his uh, desire to always grow is the same as mine. It kept pushing me and motivating me. Now, simultaneously, how does that work in your business life with you making more money? Are you surrounding yourself with the right books and the right people that say, yes, you can. There is a next level. Yes, is the perfect time. Yes, you may fail. Yes, it may be hard, but it's worth it and you can do it. Or do you have people in your life that are saying, well, I don't know if it's the right time. I know it can work, but I don't know if it can work for you. Or maybe the market's too saturated or it doesn't, it's just not your time or you don't have the education or the right partners. Same when you go to the gym. If I would have showed up this morning and Trent would have said, man, I'm a little tired. I was up late. Yeah, me too. We would have screwed that workout up. We, it just, it literally is that simple. So let me ask you again, are you surrounding yourself with a growth mindset? Tell someone in your life the truth. Tell them if they're, if they're failing. Tell yourself the truth. Tell the people around you. Tell coworkers, but find a way to do it with class. Try, find a way to do it with empathy, but find a way to realize that telling the truth solves problems. 
Brutal honesty, transparency, authenticity sets your soul free in a way that, again, I can't quantify. I can just say to you, you need to try it. What if it's just one week of your life where you don't, again, you don't talk about people. One week of your life where you tell the people in life in your life what you really feel just in, a, in, a, in, a, in the best way possible. What if you are open to hearing the truth from other people about you and instead of getting defensive, instead of letting your ego take control, you go, wow, could some of this be true? I've done so much of this going through a divorce and wanting to be friends with my ex and want my kids to thrive that I learned so much about me and I feel I'm on a completely different level and I want that experience for you. So brutally honest and transparent this week. Try it. See how it sticks. Your next level of life lives on the other side of your biggest worry, your biggest fear, your biggest obstacle. And I can only say it by going through it as I re I'm repeating myself because I want to hammer this home. Face it deal with it, fix it, and watch how much you grow. I can honestly say I'm in a place right now that I'm blessed that I went through it. I'm a better version of me. The mistakes I made, I'll never make again. And the next level of life is just an inch away from me. Right. Do you remember when something goes wrong, and you can think about this too, like from a girlfriend leaving you to losing your money to the business didn't work. And then you don't just go, wow, she left me. You're like, wow, she left me. I'll never be in love. I'm going to be miserable. I'm going to be, maybe I'll be bad to the next girl. I'll be alone forever. I'm never going to have kids. Like you stack all right. this negativity. When you it paint, rains, it pours. Yeah, yeah you, you start pay, looking You paint for this negative future. And I, I think we're designed that way because I can remember staying up all night, just stacking stuff. Like, so when that happened, I was already uh, supporting my mom and dad. I had never worked, I've never worked for anybody in my entire life. And I, when that happened, I started thinking, I started stacking all the negativity. I was like, oh my God, I'm gonna go broke. Oh my God, it's gonna be in the paper. Oh my God, all my friends would be like, ah, I told you you couldn't make it, dreamer. Wow, yeah. And then I said, oh my God, I'm probably gonna have to go to work so I can keep supporting my parents. Wow. Like I stacked so much, like <laughs> one thing happened and I'm stacking like, like a mile future, long, yeah, right? Yeah. So, well, it's true, most of us deal with some variation of this. So, so what I've learned through the years, and I didn't know I did it then, but I kind of, I call it this like success loop now. I'll just go through it quick because you said how to put it in real, like this was a pivotal moment in my life. Like I didn't have a million and a half dollars and I invested all the money I had into my next business and that business was eating money and now this money was going away and I owed money and my attorney said I had to file bankruptcy. Stacked all the negativity, didn't sleep, sick to my stomach. But then what shifted it is somehow, now it's a process. Now this is a process I go through and take this process. Don't do this to yourself. I started stacking what could go right. And it was kind of off balancing what could go wrong. It was like my brain wanted to go wrong, wrong, wrong. I'm like, no, what about right, 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 wrong, wrong, wrong. So I was balancing and it started to, I calmed down a little bit. And as soon as I calmed down, I started focusing on solutions. Like, how can I fix this? How can I get through it? No, I'm not filing bankruptcy. And I worked on solutions. But then what really got me is I started thinking of who I didn't want to be. I didn't want to be somebody who used to be successful. I didn't want my friends to say, ah, Dreamer knew it. Yeah, used I to didn't be. want to be the guy that almost made it and had that story for 20 years. Like back in the night, back in the early 2000s, I was almost there, but then this guy ripped me off and screwed exactly. me. In. Like how many people do you know that yeah, have yeah. that bitter moment? Exactly. Oh, yeah. big business. It's all crooks. Right, and, right. Yeah, the the yeah, real yeah. estate market turned and robbed my life. That was 20 years ago. Time yeah. to jump back on the horse. <laughs> right, yeah. right. My boss fired me. My partner stole my money. My wife cheated on me and left me. Okay. That's your, like you can either loathe on that and focus on that or you can learn from it, call it research and development and go forward. So I started, that, yeah. I started saying to myself, do who do you want to be? The guy that used to be or may almost was successful. And then I started writing down who I wanted to be. I wanted to be the guy that got through an almost impossible situation. No money, a million and a half in debt, partner I had to go to court to take back a broken company. I want to be the guy that gets through this. So you, I want you, this story. Figure out what success means to you and go after that and don't worry about the other stuff. Experiences, remember the moments in between, they're priceless. Yes, money can make it, all those things easier, so go after it. But spend the money you have on things that are smart. Make sure, take an, take an audit. What are you spending money on? Can you gain more education? Can you gain more wisdom? Can you get in a mastermind group? Can you, can you learn, from, can you hire a mentor? Can you start that business? Can you, can you sacrifice here that doesn't really move the needle of your happiness to, to plant apple trees, I always say. Planting apple trees sucks. You plant them, they don't produce fruit for six to 10 years, but once they do, they produce forever. Are you planting any apple trees in your life? Are you looking for the instant gratification, right? So think about all those things. I was all over the board and decide this week, are you spending money on the right things? Do you really know what success is?
Do you realize that some of the things that you might be striving for will give you a bump of happiness for a week, a month, six months, but they're not sustainable? You being the best version of you, you understanding what success means and you gaining the knowledge and the wisdom to get there will fulfill you in ways that I could only, I could only emphasize with all of me, with all my enthusiasm are the way to pure happiness, to pure abundance. At the end of your life, you could say, I've made millions and I lost my family. I made millions. I don't have any friends. Or you could say, I made millions and I lived life with fruitful relationships, with fruitful experiences. And I put my money in the most important places to get me there. Don't be satisfied. Don't ever be satisfied with okay. Don't be satisfied with good. Go for excellent. Go for outstanding. You know what your potential is. That's when that, that icky, creepy, eerie feeling you have inside. Why, why I just want more. Why, it's because you deserve more. You're talented enough. You have the capabilities. If you suck at some stuff, great. Join the crowd. So do I. I suck at more stuff than I'm good at but I got really great at the stuff I'm good at and so can you. You don't want to look back at the end of your life and go, why didn't I make that decision? Why didn't I get healthier sooner? Why didn't I fix that bad relationship? Why didn't I say no or end a, a bad relationship? Or why didn't I start that business? Do you think you'd be better starting and failing something with your passion or sticking and being safe in something that's slowly robbing your life, your juice for life? Again, I know it's easier said than done. You have life, you have bills, you have mortgages, you have relationship, you have kids, we have all this stuff. But man, in the end of the day, are we going to look back and say, I'm so glad I played safe. I'm so glad I didn't t to try to do something older. I'm so glad I just, I just played small and didn't reach my full potential. Hell no. Not one of you watching me. You are not the type to watch me if that's the life you want. So today, I'm not encouraging you to do something drastic. I'm just encouraging you to investigate. Do the exercise. Look into your future on two different paths. Look down the road a year, five, ten, even twenty, and see what path you think you should take. Reverse engineer it and decide today. Listen, when you put yourself out there like I have with infomercials and writing books and on social media and, and you know, Facebook and Instagram, when you're out there putting your message, you have to be willing to take on the haters, take on the naysayers, take on the people that want to criticize you. But let me start first off by saying that they've never made a statue of a critic. They've only made the statue of the people that were once considered crazy, nuts, taking a chance, a dreamer, insane. I mean, think about that. The, the revolutionaries, the ones that made an impact, the ones that changed the laws, the, one that, the ones that ended the wars, the ones that created freedom for a, a group of people or a country or, 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 or their race were always the crazy ones. They were the ones on the edge that had to absorb the criticism, had to listen to all the naysayers. And I would say that feedback can either be the anchor that you drag across the desert or it can be the wind behind your sail. In life, however we frame an action, however we interpret an action is the result we get. It's the feeling we get. If you're an underdog, if you're someone who says you can't, you could take the power of it won't work for you or you can't do that or you're not smart enough or why are you trying to pretend to be something you're not? You could take that and say, uh, yeah, that's what they think. I should play small. Or you can reverse that and say, wow, is that what they think of me? Wait till I show them. Remember, how it goes in has nothing to do with how we interpret it. It could be our fuel or it could be our kryptonite. How long do you hold a grudge? When something goes wrong in your life, when someone isn't fair to you, someone's unfaithful to you, someone lies to you, uh, things didn't go right, they didn't ask you to the movie, they didn't ask you to be a partner, um, they were just something that rubbed you wrong. It was your perception of something that offended you and you were upset or you held a grudge or, or had a grudge. So let me just ask you something. How long does it take you to get over that? It's a really important question because here's what I know. In all my obsessive study of successful people, happier people, yes, I say success, I mean money in a lot of cases, but I also mean abundance and joy. Would you take a million dollars? Would you take 10 million right now to be miserable for the rest of your life? I, I doubt it. So that's why we talk about the millionaire success habits as the foundation for all success, right? Um, so let me just ask you, how long do you hold on to a grudge? And let me just ask you, if you're someone who holds on for a long time, how does that serve you? How does that feel when you obsess about why could this happen to me? That is the crappiest question in the world. Or, or why would they do that to me? 
or here's even a better one, I didn't deserve that. In most cases, probably all of those are true, but even though it's true, it doesn't serve you in any way possible. In fact, it does the opposite of serve you because it's not like God or whoever you believe in, the, the universe or, 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 or your creator, whatever you believe in comes down and says, you didn't deserve that. I'm sorry it happened. Uh, who are we looking for? That life, we get our ass kicked in life. That, that's okay. The people who can handle that, the ones that can handle the problems, the ones that can learn from it are the ones that go to the next level. So let me just ask you again. Are you someone that gets over something right away or are you someone that holds on to it? Because if you hold on to it, the only thing that can do is delay the progress of your life. I screwed up in my marriage. My ex screwed up. We both screwed up. We, we admit our faults. We admit where we ignored the wrong things, where we pushed things off so far it was too late by the time we wanted to fix it. With all the good I've done, with all the positivity, I, I messed up. And, and I can admit that. And I hope that you can admit where we mess up. We do, but how do I honor those mistakes? By never making them again. I will never make the same mistakes. I give my ex the most respect, love. I'm still her family. She still got my back. I still got hers. We still are gonna make sure the kids are first. And I see another level of life for me and my kids beyond anything I could ever imagine. I listen to people all the time and they're always telling me their old story. Yeah. You know, they're just, they live in they their don't old know it, story though. and they don't know they it. They don't know it. But the, just the concept of a story overall that we tell ourselves, you, you speak about that probably more eloquently than anybody that I've heard. So just touch on the whole concept of yeah. the cognizance of the story we tell ourselves. Yeah, so I think, I mean, even with me, like I said, I had to catch myself. I was telling myself a story mm. that maybe I should have stayed with the real estate brand. Mm. Maybe success there's so many people diluting it that haven't had the success, they don't recognize the real thing. Like I, mm. I had all kinds of stories. I'd look at people like, God, God, that guy seems like a scammer. Why has he got three million followers? Like I started telling myself stuff yeah. and I felt bad yep. and I wasn't having the momentum that I know how to create. Yeah. And then all of a sudden I changed that story and I said, no, I know what I want to do for people. I'm the freaking best at it. There's nobody better than me. Mm. Give me a year, I'll be far surpassed and then they'll realize they're actually learning from someone who's done it. Yeah. And nothing changed. God didn't come down, the weather didn't change, my bank account didn't change, the, so nothing changed except my story. So, so the part that I wanna share is, I did a, uh, I did a interview with a young kid, uh, Casey Adams. I Love Casey, yeah, I've so done Casey asked, you know, So great he asked kid. me, great kid. Yeah. And he said, hey man, at the end, maybe he asked you, he said, you were, as a young kid, and there's a lot of young kids listening, mm -hmm. what would be the one thing you that you would tell people? And I'd never been asked that. Mm -hmm. I, and literally what just came out is that your thoughts lie to you mm. and to question those thoughts. Mm. Because when I look back at what stalled me or almost had me fail or the people around me, it had nothing to do with who's president, whether you like the president or not, if he's crazy or not, the economy, mm. your, your family, your friends holding you down, a job that takes too much time. It's never any of that. The only thing standing between you and your next level, a better version of you, not Mm. Not being me, not being Ed, not just a better version of you. The only thing, and you might not believe me right now, but I promise you someday you will. The only thing standing between you and your next level, a better version of you, is the story you tell yourself on why you can't get it. That's it. So good. I mean, so I think good. about it. I remember having a real estate deal when I was broke, and it's a million dollar deal, and I got four bucks in the bank. And I'm saying, I'll never get this money. I'll never, and I never could. And then all of a sudden, I'm like, no, screw that. I'm getting this money. Mm. And I would find it. It didn't mm. matter if I had to beg, borrow, steal, you know, some with the bank, some on credit cards, borrowing from this guy. Mm. I'd make the deal happen when nothing else changed. Mm. I didn't inherit money. I didn't get smarter. My IQ didn't go up. I didn't have a Harvard education. I just willed it by changing the story. So. I guess an easy way for you guys to think about right now, if you talk about what you would, where you would love to be, it's a year from now, it's the greatest year of your life and you'd love to be there. I'd love to be um, you know, working on my own, on my own uh, company. I'd love to, to launch my own company. I'd like to have more time with my wife or my husband and my kids. Just say, but, and then fill in whatever that but is. That's usually your story. But my boss keeps me, my boss keeps me too busy. But my wife doesn't support me. But my family thinks I'm crazy. But I'm not that smart. But it takes money to make money. That's your story that's the thing that's your anchor you're dragging across the desert flip that story and immediately that becomes the wind behind your sail I mean I don't want to oversimplify it but at this phase of my life it is oversimplified <laughs> and I still run into it I will catch myself being in a space worried about something worried about something with my kids worried about anything and I'm like why is this bugging me why is this? oh because I'm telling myself lies I'm telling myself some stuff <laughs> I change it and then I change in a second it's not the objects it's the things that we get to experience
Mm. So you can't buy your way. I, I, a lot, I had a lot of pain as a kid, which we all did. And I, I know I thought for a time in my life that money would fix that. And there's nothing more than the experience. My daughter's on her first trip with me as a business trip. This will last. This is worth millions to me. I'd give up all my books to have that. So it's the, it's the moments and the experience, not the things. I'm more motivated today than I've ever been because now I realize I was put on this earth to share a story, to give capabilities, to make impact. So the deans that are in their 20s right now thinking, I don't think I could do this, it's the wrong time, wrong president, I missed my window. All that, all that same fear was the same fear as I had. I wasn't smart enough, I didn't have the money to start, no one gives me a chance, no one believes me, people think I'm insane, people call me dreamer, like I'm the oddball, I'm the black sheep of the family, I'm the underdog. All those feelings so many people have, and they're one shift, one little shift, not a million, away from getting course corrected. They're one shift away from being 30 or 20 years later like I am now and looking back, my brand's broken a billion dollars in sales. Incredible. From that guy living in a bathroom, working out of an old beat up barn, Incredible. right? So I just hope, and I know you, universe, great people and, and I love the inspiration, but I hope today you see, like I would love for you to say, holy <laughs> Dean's not that smart. <laughs> yeah. Like I would love for you to say, oh my God, if Dean could do it, I could. I have a seventh grade vocabulary, even if you read my books. I write the way I talk. I mean, yeah, if you read my yes. book, you know, I write, the, it's a dialogue, it's a conversation, right? So if nothing else of that story, just knowing that you can, because a lot of times all someone needs to hear, and that's why I commended you for what you do. Sometimes Thank all you. someone needs to hear is a story. Yeah. Like, because the capabilities are out there, the personal growth is out there, the tools are out there. But if you don't have the foundation, if someone doesn't give you a chance, if someone doesn't show you can, then you start believing you can't. And then there's this certain age where you find like, oh, maybe later. And, and I'm right. gonna do another thing to hopefully disturb you. Screw later. Because the last five years went by too fast for all of you. Wait till you get older. Five years goes by in a minute. And you start saying, well, let me take this job for five years yeah. and then I'll work on me. Oh, let me, I'm gonna get married. Let me keep the job talking about, oh, oh, we got pregnant. Let me wait till the first kid's old enough. Oh, let me wait till they're in high school. Oh, let me wait till they're out of college. And all of a sudden you're 60 years old. And you're like, where the did my life go? I want it back. You know how many people I talk to are like, I, I didn't take chances, I didn't take risks. You want to get disturbed, picture being 90 years old and you lived someone else's life. Like you always had this desire to do it, you're going to be 90 going, can I get another shot? Like I don't want that. I would much rather, did you, did you ever hear the Theodore Roosevelt quote, man in the arena? No. Oh, you got to Google it. I, I don't have it, but basically yeah. I don't remember it off the top of my head, but it's really, it was this amazing speech he did in France and it was like, at a, at a paraphrase, you gotta find it, but basically it said, if you're not in the arena with me, if you're not playing ball, if you're not bloodied, if you're not marred, if you don't have failure, then don't dare judge me, don't dare give me a word. I refuse yeah. to listen to anybody who sits in the sidelines and points fingers at me. It said, I would much rather end my life knowing I tried valiantly and failed than to sit on the sidelines and poke fingers. But the the ultimate end would be that I went after it when everyone told me, I got goosebumps, yeah. everybody told me I couldn't uh -huh. and, I, and I figured it out along the way. Like it's such a great quote and basically what that means to me is I don't wanna sit in the si stands and wear someone else's jersey on my back. I wanna be on the field, even if I'm losing, at least I'm fighting for what I want. So don't wear someone else's jersey, get in the arena and fail, like you can't win unless you're in it. I love that. How do we take the goals that you desire, how do we pretend it's six months from now, we're looking backwards and they have them, and attach an emotion to it, so it becomes a feeling, so it gets stuck to your subconscious, so it becomes your reality. That's like manifesting on steroids, right? But here's something on the other side that most people don't do. What I'd like you to also do, is I'd like you to pick the goals that are left, that you're gonna get done by the end of the year, because you're, if you're listening to me live as I'm doing these, this is half more than halfway through the year. If you if you push in some off till next year, that's fine, but the ones you're gonna get done, now I want you to think about it six months from now, and you didn't achieve those goals. And you need to feel that too. Sit in it, it's six months from now, and you're looking back and go, wow, another year went by, and I'm still stuck in this job. Another year went by, I still didn't fix this relationship. Another year went by, I'm staying in an abusive relationship. Another year went by, I didn't spend the time to try to date and meet someone new. Another year went by, I didn't register the URL. I didn't make the phone call. I didn't dig into the course. I didn't go through the coaching. I, what will that emotion feel like? And let that bathe in that feeling. 
Bathe in feeling like another year's gone. Bathe in the fact of, wow, at this age, I thought I'd be further ahead. Because here's what I know. Some of you listen, make moves based on a bigger future. You're moving towards something better. You're aspirational, you're inspired. You see the bigger life, you see the bigger house, the bigger business, the bigger success, the bigger significance in the world, the bigger impact in the world. You see it, it drives you. Some of you listening right now, that scares you. If that scares you, then fine. You're a move away from person. You wanna move away from a job you don't like. You wanna move away from a bad relationship. You wanna move away from being broke. You wanna move away, that's fine. Some of you are move away people, some of you are move towards. And sometimes when you get past the move away fear, then you can be a move towards person. That's the goal, it's like move out of fear and move towards pleasure. Listen, what drives all of us in life? Fundamentally, we all boil down to we want to avoid pain and we want to go towards pleasure. So if that's you, which is everybody in the world, use whatever one it takes. So again, this is your wake up call. You're, if you're listening to me, like I said, live kind of the week I'm doing them, it's more than halfway through the year. What have you accomplished? What have you let slip? What habits have you fallen back into? Where have you let your life just go on autopilot? Pick the goals you need to get done. This is your action call. Put them on a new list. Put them on a list that they're gonna get done and push, like I said, push some of them off. But the ones you push off, have an action plan for them starting next year. Get the ones done now. Remember, for future pace, six months from now, they are accomplished, attach a feeling, attach an emotion, cry if you have to, get emotional, laugh, smile, pretend you're in a situation that, that lights you up. But then also do the opposite side. Pretend it's six months from now and none of them got done. You're still in the same place. How does that feel? All I know is this is the last five years went by in a flash. How do you think the next five years are gonna feel? And if you don't make a change now, if you don't take action now, what's gonna be different in your life? This is the halfway through the year wake up call. How long does it take for you to get over a failure? I believe that the two correlate. I believe how long it takes you to get over someone taking advantage of you, how long you hold a grudge is probably about the same amount of time it takes you when you try a business and it doesn't work out, when you try a partnership and the partner lets you down, uh, when you go after a course and the course didn't work. And then when it doesn't work out, you find reasons why it didn't, it frustrates you, it annoys you, and then you go back to the life where you're at. Now, I wasn't trying to pigeonhole everybody who's listening. <laughs> what I'm trying to do is make a point. If this is just even a fraction of you, these are the types of things, doesn't matter how good you are, there's a whole nother level. You see, I've been obsessively working on letting go of grudges and letting go of failures faster and faster every year of my entire life. Yes, I want to fail faster than anyone. If I look back in my 20s, being broke, not having money, wanting another level of life, didn't go to college, I realized one of the things that I had that most people didn't is that I could let go of a failure really fast. In fact, even beyond that, I could get so pumped up, so motivated, so inspired about a project. You ever been there, been so excited about something, wanting to do it, you're like, I'm going for this, I don't care what anybody says, and you go and you put all your enthusiasm and you stay up nights and, and you go after it and then you try it and then it fails. They're the hardest ones to let down. It's like a relationship that you work so hard and you think the other person's on the same page as you and they're not. All of a sudden you're let down massively. Same kind of feeling when it's a business or, or, or anything that you're working hard on or working hard for a swim meet and you, you swim all summer to lose the race, right? I think about that. I look back in my 20s and one thing I had, I wasn't smart enough to read a lot of books or go to read courses or go to events like I should have or learn from others as much as I should have. So I'm obsessed with it now. It's why I love training and sharing and delivering you anything I can to give you a heads up is I failed fast. I, I failed. It doesn't matter how excited I was when I failed. I'd mope and grope and be so pissed off. But by 48 hours later, I was over it. The quicker you could focus on how to fix it, the quicker you can learn from your failure, the quicker you can anchor those emotions, those feelings, that's when knowledge becomes wisdom. I truly believe with all of me that knowledge is something we can all acquire. Information, we can all get it. There's more information out now than ever before in history. So knowledge is easy to find in today's world. Information, easy to find. Wisdom, ha, that's hard to come by because wisdom is when you take knowledge, take information, put it into play, get your ass kicked in some places, learn from your mistakes, learn from the pain, and power through. So, again, 
This is what I want you to think about. I don't care where you are. If, it, if you hold a grudge shorter than anybody else, go shorter. If you rebound from a failure quicker than anyone you know, rebound quicker. Successful people rebound fast. And while they're rebounding, they're actually learning from the horrible experience they had. Transform the experience. Think of failures in a way to do an experience transform, uh, tra experience transformation. I just made that up. Transform the experience from something you call a failure, something painful, into, wow, I got that one out of the way. I learned from it. I know what to do next. A huge factor standing between you and the money you deserve are the beliefs that you have about money. So let's talk about the first belief that money is scarce. How many times have you heard that money doesn't grow on trees? It's as, it's as if we live in constant fear that somebody's taking money away. You could kill those slides now, guys. It's like it'll vanish, when the fact is, we know that money doesn't actually vanish. There's the same amount of money now as there was in all times. In fact, there's probably more money. Money doesn't go away. The fact of the matter is what happens to money is it transfers from one person to another. It transfers to the group of people that know how to make it. So the question shouldn't be, how do I protect and save? Has anybody, has, is it really possible to save your way to being rich or do you have to actually earn it? You have to earn it, but sometimes we have this ability like, like save, 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 and we're not spending the time. That's a scarcity mindset because it's not going away. The question, instead of saying, how do we save it? The question needs to be, how do I become part of the group that not the money is not being transferred away from? How do I become part of the group that the money is being transferred to? Does that make sense? Can I get a yup? You can put this up on the screen. I've shared this a lot, but I think this statistic says it all. In 2017, there were 1,700 new millionaires, not the existing ones. There was 1,700 new millionaires created, how often? Every day in America, more than ever before in the history of America. Is this a good time to make money? And this is a good time for money to be transferred to you. Talk to me in your study about how imperfect you found a lot of you know, successful entrepreneurs are. Like, how possible is it through taking just a series of, like you said, small pivots, small habits that could totally change the trajectory of your life? Can you talk to me about what yeah, you yeah, found yeah. in your study? Of Absolutely. So I love to talk about what's going on right now. So I'm here with you now. I literally was in Puerto Rico this morning for breakfast. We're in Beverly Hills right now. Yeah. I, I was there masterminding with some dear friends. We get together and we find hidden little spots all over the world and we meet a couple times a year. Yeah. I, I chartered so I could be here on time. I landed, I came here, sat down. <laughs> so if I look a little disheveled, I'm a little out on a plane for seven and a half hours and I drove in traffic and now I'm yeah. here, right? But I was there with some people you might know. I was there with Lewis Howes, Russell Brunson, uh, Trent Shelton, um, uh, Rachel and Dave Hollis. They, Rachel's got the hottest, her Book books right are like number one in five in the world uh, in That's Amazon incredible. overall. Yeah. She's crushing it. Um, uh, I think I said Russell Brunson from ClickFunnels. I, I, there was so many. I can't even, like yeah. people that you, like when you watch them on social media, right? Um, they're just doing amazing things. My buddy Brennan Bouchard, right? right? It, Tony and I, are, are, we're doing something special. I want to tell you about that a little later. Like if you take Tony Robbins and all the people I just mentioned, mm -hmm. when you see them flying on jets, doing cool things, you're like, God. I could never get there. Right. But we just mastermind for three days. And when we do, we're dear friends and we opened up. And I can't tell you who, but there's not one of them that has a story that's not like severely tragic. Mm -hmm. I mean, two people in the group talked about this weekend how they were molested when they were young. Wow. Two, three people in the group talking about how their parents stopped talking to them because they call them dreamers. Other people, their parents split and left them on grandma's doorstep. Mm -hmm like broke, no school, couldn't graduate. Like, like everybody's got the story. Right. And, and I don't say that to make what you're going through, to minimize what you're going through. It doesn't matter if you came from perfect parents and you still feel empty on the inside or you came from unbelievably horrific background. The only thing I know is there is no ingredient for success that has to do with your past. Omar, I know a little bit about your past. You struggle with a lot of things. Your past was there and it was designed for you to be the man you are today. And those that realize that, those that can say, okay, today's the shift. Today, and this is the most important part, what every single one of them had in common. Some of the top influencers in the world that I just mentioned, right? Influencers, when I say influencer, people who are really doing it, <laughs> really making an doesn't don't just have followers, right? right? Um, what they did is found a way, and this is kind of Tony Robbins 101, 
is they found a way to change the story. Mm. And Rachel Hollis, amazing woman, like killing it right now, an inspiration to millions of women. Her mom, her father, her, her siblings didn't believe in what she was doing. They thought she was crazy, right? right? She, she's gonna, her husband, I mean, there was a point with her husband where, and she writes about this in her book, where he didn't believe her. He's like, he thought personal development was for broken people. Yeah. And his <laughs> wife is literally going to Tony Robbins and writing books and doing, and he felt that. And there was a point in their, and they got the best relationship you've ever seen. Like, right. amazing couple. And it's, I love and it's them. a classic challenge that you find in the personal development world. Yeah. One, one spouse, spouse is into yeah. it, one's out. And yeah. one day, she, either, she literally said to him, you're either, on board or you're not like basically and and the good man that he is he went to tony robbins with her <laughs> he started doing it, and now they work together managing Incredible. this but wow. like a riff and a relation like all of these things but one thing is different is they found a way to say i'm not going to fail or be held back because of these circumstances i'm going to use them as the fuel to keep me going the biggest lie we've ever been told is to work on our weaknesses all that does is rob your confidence. There's people in this room right now that are living an okay life because you feel that you're not good enough. You're not smart enough in a certain area. You're not good at bookkeeping. You're afraid at sales. You're not that organized. Screw all that. Get amazing at what you're good at and pay someone to do the stuff you suck at. Does that sound right? But we're taught through school, we're taught through life that we have to get good at everything. It's just simply not true. Every entrepreneur I know, every successful person I know, they just found what drove them and got them excited and went for it. So I want to encourage you to, to not be fooled by that working on your weaknesses. Don't hold that back and say, well, I could if. I had all those thoughts. What, what, I mean, I wrote a book. Someone who was in special reading barely got out of high school. I wrote a book, for gosh sakes. I felt so insecure in my first book. And then I give it to my, I give it to my editor, and my editor calls me up and says, hey, I just want to tell you, this doesn't need a rewrite. Or this doesn't need an edit. It needs a whole new rewrite. This isn't a book. It's a 300-page conversation. Don't put this out there. Really, you don't want to. And I almost threw the book in the garbage because I started thinking, oh, who am I to think I could write? I'm not that smart. That's for people who go to college. All those limiting beliefs, all those negative stories. And then finally, I, I found myself saying, no, I just want to give a message to somebody. I don't think people care if it's written perfect. If it sounds like a conversation, great. Almost threw that book away, and I kid you not, I was an inch away from deleting the whole book and saying, forget about that. I'm great at real estate. I shouldn't have tried to write books. And that book, and it hit, it hit the New York Times bestseller list in 10 days, my first book. So I didn't mean to go down that path, but that's, I'm really passionate about that because if I would have listened to my guidance counselor, if I would have listened to Miss Thompson in seventh grade, if I would have listened to everybody else, I'd be living their life. Instead, I'm living mine. I encourage you to live yours. When you work on the things that drive you, fuel you, that excite you, that you're good at, you find the enthusiasm, you break through. I would much rather give a mediocre, listen to this, and this is something that's factual and I've done it over and over and it always works. I would much rather give a mediocre opportunity to someone with passion who knew their unique ability and were ready to dive in, then give the perfect opportunity who is to someone that's not in their unique ability. They're just trying to struggle through it. Like so many times we want to, we want to get someone to work with us or for us or next to us because they're not really doing anything and we're trying to force them into doing it. You're like, God, they're not, they don't have anything going on. Why aren't they doing this? Because it, maybe it doesn't align with them. You know this. When you feel aligned with something you're doing, do you, you're unstoppable. You can break through anything. Nothing's going to stop you. So what I want to do today, before we get done, and I'm going to give you a process to look inside yourself, to find the things that you're good at, that you love to do, that also simultaneously can cut you the biggest check possible, right? That's Dan Sullivan 101. I'm going to give you my version of it, but think if you're aligned with yourself while at the same time you're doing things that can cut you a bigger check. That's when life exponentially grows. I'd like to talk about what you have to give up what you have to let go of. As you take this journey to be more successful, as you gain self-education by listening to me and others that are actually playing the game at the highest level possible, as your mind grows, as you shift your thinking, you're gonna have to let go of old thoughts. You're gonna have to let go of beliefs that may have been your parents. You know, sometimes you're a Republican because your parents were, or you're a Democrat because they were, or you're Christian because your parents were, or you like a certain football team because your parents like that football team. Well, it's the same thing here when it comes to thinking. 
love your parents, love your surroundings from when you grew up and always cherish that. But if there's another level of life that you desire and you crave, you might have to give up some of the thinking that they gave you. You might have to give up some friends. Along the journey of being an entrepreneur, I, I can remember being young and family members telling me how nuts I was and, and that I should stop being a dreamer. Family, eh, they kind of get a pass and you go through and sometimes you're close, sometimes you're not, at least in my case, and then it circles back around, but they're your family. They're there for life. But I can remember friends that would always tell me, slow down, dude, that stuff's for other people. You can't have that. And I can remember friends literally getting mad that I was going after stuff or investing in real estate or investing and trying to get on TV when I did my first infomercial or did my first course and training on how to help people go faster and my success training. And, and I remember along the way that I would have friends ride with me to a certain level and then they couldn't handle it anymore because they didn't want to go for it. Or they felt inferior because, I, not that I was successful, they felt inferior or maybe it was ego or maybe it was envy, but they would start wanting to drag me back to them. And the truth is, I had to let them go. There was nothing I can do. Some, some stuck, I'm literally recording this right now in my house and behind me, if you're watching video, over on the other side of the house is my dearest friend from when I was literally five, six, seven years old, we met. He's really one of the few friends that stuck the whole way. I still love the guys I grew up with, but a lot of times it just changes because I want to surround myself with people who have a bigger future mindset. They want tomorrow to be bigger than yesterday. A lot of times in life, people get stuck without even realizing. It doesn't mean they don't have huge hearts. It doesn't mean they're amazing. It doesn't mean you don't love them and will love them to the day you die, to the day you die, but they have bigger past mindsets. So when you're talking about how tomorrow could be better, they're talking about back in the good old days when we had that other present, when we were back in college, back in high school, back when the economy was different, back when the Republicans ran it, back when the Democrats ran it, or whatever it is, they have a bigger past mindset and you looking at a bigger future mindset just conflicts and you have to let them go. What <laughs> advice out of all you've learned, over a billion dollars, failure, mistakes, all the success books, he said, what, have you, what could you tell me it was just one thing, which is a hard thing and I didn't think about it in advance. Of course, yeah. And I said, he said, what would it be? I said, learn to observe your thoughts quicker. It took me till I was in my probably 40s to really understand that your thoughts lie to you. And your thoughts will steer you down the road. Like, when your thoughts, have you ever, you're listening, have you ever um, like thought a girlfriend did something wrong and all of a sudden you're right. all fired up, like how could she do this? Or a boyfriend, you emotionally respond, and then you get there and you find it was all it didn't even happen. Right, or yeah. like, I can't believe my buddies went to the movie and they didn't invite me and, and you realize they left you a voice memo. Like things yeah. can happen to fire us up that are just our perception of a situation. Yeah. Or insecurities that are bubbling up or whatever it is. I yeah. mean, think about, when I, when I say that, is like think of thoughts, right? Two identical situations. There's a car accident. Two people are involved. One circumstance, someone gets out and screams their head off. How can you do this? I'm going to be late. My insurance is going to go up. What are you, stupid? How can you do right. this? You, like, don't you and, see right, it? Yeah, don't yeah. you see, like, are you blind? Right, yeah. that's one. Same circumstance. Right. Someone else does it and gets out and says, they say, I'm sorry. Go, oh, no big deal. It's cars. Yeah. It's metal. We have insurance. Nobody's hurt. Who cares? Hey, can I buy you a coffee? You look a little shaken up. Yeah. Right. So when <laughs> someone says no, when right. somebody says get real or this is what actually happened, nothing is what actually happened. What happened is the, the, situ is the perception of a situation. Now, I know you probably heard that a million times, but maybe this is the first time you actually think about it. Your situation right now is being held back or being fueled simply by, by what you think you have, right? And when you change that story, you change your life. Like, and one of the ways that I think is really important is if you feel like you can't start your own company because you don't have money and you're not smart enough, then go Google John Paul DeGiorgio and look at his story. That's who started yeah. Vidal We actually Sessi. had him on the show. What's that? We actually oh, interviewed great. him I love on the John show. Paul, yeah. right? Amazing. Go Google Richard Branson, Tony Robbins, me, everybody I know, everybody I was with this weekend. <laughs> None of them started with money. None right. of them were like, hey, here's a hundred grand, go start your business, or right? Or a blueprint on how to do right. it, yeah. Three quarters of the people we were with this weekend didn't go to college. Like, not that you find someone who you say, I can't do it, I don't have a supportive spouse. Find someone who didn't have a supportive spouse and they did it anyway and prove that the story that your subconscious has developed to protect yourself. Like literally when it pops up, that, that limiting belief, that doubt talk, that, that inner villain says, it's the wrong time, wrong president, wrong economy, wrong. just prove it wrong and call it a liar and start figuring a way to empower that.
And Tony Robbins, I go to, I fly down to Florida. He says, come down, spend a couple days with me. I go down with his, him and his amazing wife, Sage. We're at his house. And Tony looks at me and he goes, brother, all I've ta- heard you talk about is what could go wrong and who you don't want to be. You can't create a bigger future. And we're going to get into that next without this one thing. I, I got to ask you this. And I remember he got like this close to my face. And he said to me, who do you want to become in your 50s? I've heard it a million times. I've read it in books, but that, if I look at you right now, I don't care if you're in your 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s, who do you want to become in your next generation? Who, not what are you going to accomplish, how much money you're going to have, who do you want to become? Man, at that moment, it hit me. I want to become a man who admitted his mistakes and attracts the most amazing woman in his life and I want to be a man that's obsessively in love with one woman. I want to be the father that my kids look at and go, my dad went through a tough time, divorce was tough, business wasn't easy, Guy, my dad lived in a trailer park when he was a kid, didn't have an education past ninth grade, but my dad accomplished it. He's an amazing father, he's an amazing husband to his wife, he's an amazing leader, he's an amazing role model for people. Like that's who I want to become. And when I started thinking about that, I don't, I don't know about you, man. I'm getting goosebumps right now. I started feeling empowered on who I want to become, not what I want to achieve. So for me, the momentum is starting, right? I was going down. That's why this loop. I was going down. Who do I not want to become? And going down, all of a sudden, you could start spinning this momentum, right? Do you ever like go behind a boat or see somebody behind a boat on a tube when they, when they whip the boat around, that tube's like, it goes so fast. That's this. You see, the problem is so many people get to these points and the momentum going down steers them off or throws them off. And then they live life flat. They live life saying, I almost made it. If that recession didn't come in 2017, I would have been fine. If COVID didn't take my legs out, I would have been fine. If my business didn't go, I would have been, if I didn't go through that divorce, I would have been fine. It's because they just bailed on one of these things. It was so painful. They didn't have a process to get through the loop. They bailed on one of them. And that's the person (coughs) you talk to in the Uber or, or, you know, great people that say, I almost made it, but, screw but. We all have that. We all have something. We're all different, we all have unique circumstances, but the people who make the difference are the ones that stay in the game and have a process to get through the game. And that's why I wanted to give you this framework. Create the not to do list. That's another training we've done. But when you start getting this vision, when you start understanding what your unique abilities are, what could cut you the biggest check and knowing where you wanna go, you're spending the time here with me. When you know that, then it's time for you to make a not to do list. What are the things you should not be doing There's too many, all of us are. I still do, but I make the list all the time. What are the things that don't serve you? Write them down. Because when you write down things you shouldn't be doing, when they don't serve that bigger future, when they're not in your unique ability, when they're not cutting you a check, when they're not taking you towards your bigger goal, that should be on your not to-do list. And remember in today's world, there's so many things that you shouldn't be doing, right? So when you make a not to-do list, I always write you can do four things. You can eliminate it. Um, Ariana Huffington is a good friend of mine. She started Huffington Post in her 60s and she sold it for $300 million. Uh, she said sometimes the best way to, uh, to uh, get things off your list and they should be on your not to do list is just quit them. Just eliminate them. You shouldn't be doing them anymore. Just quit. Sometimes a project that you've been working on for years, you're like, I'm just not doing that project because I'm not excited about it anymore. I was obligated, but I'm not obligated anymore. Obligation without commitment is a mess. Remember that obligation without a commitment is a mess, causes stress. Sometimes the best way to do it is quit it, eliminate it, stop doing it, time opens up. Next is delegate it. Do you know you could get virtual assistance? All my top students are using virtual assistance right now from the Philippines. Go to upwork.com. You can't believe four or five bucks an hour and you can get somebody for a few hours a week to do things that you can never imagine from virtually. They can do everything in today's world with technology. You have your food delivered, your house cleaned, uh, you know, t- take notes, do your taxes, you know, do, do uh, stuff on the internet. They could build click funnels pages. They could make offers in real estate. My students have virtual assistants doing their real estate offers, uh, posting signs all over Craigslist, doing ads on Facebook. It's crazy. Four bucks an hour. The world has changed. Delegate it. Get a relative, a cousin. Stop doing the things you shouldn't be doing. Or automate it. 
cool thing about technology nowadays. There's so many things we do, we get to automate. I mean, the extreme is I walk in my house and I can say, Alexa, play uh, Ed Sheeran radio. I feel like listening to that. And I'll listen to it while, and I'll go, and I'll look in the cabinet and there's no paper towels. I'll be like, Alexa, order paper towels. That's all I got to say. Next day, Amazon drops paper towels off the front door. It's insane. I didn't set it up. I had someone else, my, my wife or someone set it up, but I'm just saying the world has changed. Find out things that can you can automate that don't cause a lot of problems. It's not heavy technology, I should say. Or replace it, right? So you can automate it, you can delegate it, you can eliminate it, or you can replace it. You make that not-to-do list, what are you doing? What are we doing when we, you know, I'm tying all this together. A lot of you have heard a lot of these, but tied together to unique ability and biggest check, do you see how when you start doing more of what you're good at that puts you in flow, that gives you enthusiasm, and start saying no to the stuff that doesn't serve you, that someone else could be doing for a fraction of it. I mean, I write, I'm terrible. My words are from my mouth, but I mean, I'm terrible with spelling and grammar. I'm not going to spend time to get good at spelling and grammar. I could send it to someone at Fiverr or Upwork and have them edit it for pennies in, in most cases. Pennies. Why would I do that? My unique ability is giving you the messages and the words of going out and learning more, of gaining more wisdom so I can give you the tools so you can break through. That's where I spend my time. That's my unique ability. In a business, a job, you lose it. Right now with COVID, with all the things that went sideways, you'd be going, I lost, I lost, I lost. But what if this is the universe? God, whatever you believe in, saying what you were doing was not meant for you. It was not allowing you to live into your full potential. You have more to give the world. If you won't do it on your own, I'm going to do it for you. You won't close that door, I'm locking it. Go find something that fills your heart. People with unsuccessful businesses also take opinions from the wrong people. They take advice from your parents, advice from your friends at a, at a picnic, advice from people who pretend they know what they're doing, their coworkers. If someone's not playing the game at the highest level possible, do not listen to them. If someone tried and failed, don't listen to them because they only know how to do it wrong. But people do all these things. They focus their energy. They want to make more money. They focus their energy on the wrong uh, on the wrong areas. They focus on the products, the colors, they focus on the logos, they focus on the location or what their website should look like and all this obsessive stuff that means nothing at the end of the day. They try to create something that people need and people don't buy something unless they want it. And then when it's not working or before they launch, they ask an unqualified person. And then you wonder why your business doesn't work and you feel like you're stuck at a job or stuck in a business that's not paying you anything. And if you have your own business and you're working 40, 60, 80 hours a week and making less than you can at a job, then you just built yourself a job. You don't have your own business. People want transparency, honesty, and authenticity on the deepest level you could possibly imagine. I'm encouraging you to change the level of your transparency. I'm encouraging you not to over plan and try to perfectly script and be the most authentic version of you sharing why you've been there. I'm going to tell you to share your problems and your mistakes at the deepest level you possibly can. People will buy from you and learn from you when they feel understood. What happens with the holding the checks and the Lamborghinis and all that pieces, it's so superficial and so shallow. People wanna know what happened on the journey to get to your next level of success. How did you fail and still succeed? People know the difference. Share the experience that hurt the most. Share the experience that you were once embarrassed of and watch how people will connect with you immediately. And I'm not talking about this, the sad story and then you leave them there. I'm talking about sharing that vulnerable moment, that the mistake you made, the thing you were embarrassed about and then show them where you've come. They immediately will build rapport with you. So I'm gonna encourage you to go one step further. I'm gonna encourage you to share with people the things that you hid the things that you don't want anybody to know about, the things that you think people would judge you for, for. Those are the things that make you real. It doesn't matter what age you are. Be authentic, be enthusiastic. The biggest podcast I ever had, I shared the pain of going through a divorce last year. And I shared it authentically, I shared my pain, I shared that I had anxiety, I shared that I was human and it went crazy. It was something that I was embarrassed of, of going through a divorce. I'm the success guy and I couldn't make my marriage a success. But I shared it with my heart and it went nuts and we got tens of thousands of comments of people saying thank you. Share deeper, stronger, openly more because if you want to make an impact, let people know how much you care.
I want you to start thinking outside the box. I want you to start thinking if you want to start a business, if you want to scale a current business, or someday, maybe you're not even thinking about it now, but someday you want to, I want you to think on how you can outmarket the competition, how you can do something different than they do. How can you be a relationship marketer, not a transactional marketer? How can you build reciprocity in the area that you want to specialize in? So this morning, I had breakfast with a friend of mine named Lisa. She's awesome. She's the top hairstylist in Arizona, like literally number one. And we were talking about expanding her brand. Now she's smart as sh This girl is amazing and reads every personal growth book. She read my book before I even was friends with her. I mean, unbelievable. But what she's thinking is I need to expand my brand. So I got to, I got to take more pictures and get a lot prettier looking stuff on social media, on Instagram, especially now that's true. She should, but simultaneously, that's not going to grow your brand in today's world, especially with the algorithms of Instagram and Facebook that are just really set up for spending money to grow. Right? So the days of going viral uh, uh, and getting millions of followers on Instagram, just cause you're awesome kind of over. It happens. We're growing. We're growing at a, you know, several thousand a, a week all organically, but it's a lot of work, right? So this is what I suggested to her this morning. She's an expert at hair extensions and she wants the world to know that there's so many bad ways. There's the mid level, you know, too much hair in the mid. I, I like, and there's a big bump here or there you girls get extensions and the little clips show if they leave it on too long or hair gets brittle, all this stuff that, that I was learning. And I said, build reciprocity, do something completely different in the industry. And I, I'm saying this to her, but now I'm saying it to you. What I suggested to her is something that my dear friend, Joe Polish did many, many years ago. And it's an updated version. He did something called the consumer awareness guide in the carpet cleaning industry. You think it has nothing to do all good marketing. It doesn't matter what industry you're in. Nobody wants to get their carpets cleaned. And that guy figured out how to get people excited to do it. So think about that. Uh, a, a consumer awareness guide. So we're sitting down talking and I said, yes, there's a lot of great people in your space and they're going to do good pictures and you could do better pictures and you could fight on price. And that's what everybody does. And she's not, she's one of the most expensive. So I said, what about building reciprocity and building a relationship with clients and future clients by just simply helping them create something cooler, like the, the consumer awareness guide for hair extensions, but maybe you, you know, it's the seven taboos of getting, a." a uh, uh, hair extensions in 2018, right? So I said, we started going through it. I said, what if you just created this document that shared that you are the top hairstylist in Arizona? So you're an expert. You've been doing extensions. You're, you, she specializes in people's extensions being screwed up and then she comes and fixes them. Same with color, right? But let's just talk about the extensions now. And she has that authority. So why don't you write a consumer awareness guide, call it something sexier, but inform people on what to look out for so they can avoid their hair being screwed up. They can avoid their hair being burned off. They can avoid the puffiness. They can avoid the clips showing so everybody knows you have extensions and write like the seven deadly sins of getting the wrong hair extensions. At the same time that she's educating people, she's building reciprocity, she's helping them. What is she doing? She's getting people to look to her as the authority, the expert, like, whoa, what does Lisa say? I don't know if I'm going to get extensions. I should go to the expert. I should go to the person who's the authority helping other people know what's right or wrong. That's what a consumer awareness guide can do. That's what a great book does. If you don't have time to write a book, create a consumer awareness guide. So if you're in the fitness world, you might write the seven deadly sins of the wrong workout. If you're in the lose weight world, you might sell the, the seven deadly sins of having sugar filled breakfast. The, the, like if you're in the consulting business, you're in the coaching business, the, the seven deadly sins of having the wrong life coach, real estate coach, health coach, workout coach, right? So think about how do you build relationships? How do you build reciprocity? And because we live in a world like, hey, do something for me, I'll do something for you. What if we just lived in a world where I'm going to do a ton for you and I hope you come back? Why do you think I do these podcasts? Why do I think I created subscribedean.com so you can go there and get discounts and all that cool stuff? Because I want to give it out to the world. I, I'm, I'm doing these podcasts on my time. I'm shooting this on my day off for you. 
Not because I'm expecting you to do something right now, but when you think about wanting success education or real estate education, or you want to go to the next level or be part of a mastermind, I hope you go, wow, Dean's been helping me for years for free. His podcasts are free. He goes on social media every day for free. He goes on Instagram every day for free. He gave away 350,000 copies of his book if you just cover shipping and handling, right? Like, I want you to think about that and go, wow. And I know his values and I know what he stands for. If I'm gonna spend money for higher education, I'm gonna go with Dean. That's what I hope. I'm being transparent. I want my business to grow, but I wanna to touch more lives, right? So think about that in your business of like, what can you, instead of marketing on price or marketing like everybody else, what can you give? How can you build reciprocity? Give all of you, so when it's time for them to spend money, to get the education, to get the product, to get the service, you're the first person they think about. The last year, last two years, but really last year, I've been going through a divorce. And I have told no one, I haven't shared it publicly. A small group of my family and friends know. And it's been the most, it was the most painstaking thing I've ever experienced in my life. Now, I can go back for, through the whole thing on why this happened. There's a million reasons. The cool part is um, my ex, because we signed the divorce papers, I have to say that's the first time I ever said my ex. Um, my ex and I are dear friends, not kind of friends, not fake friends. We're true friends where we're doing a child-centered divorce. The focus is on our kids. You see, I'm gonna back up here in a, in a moment and tell you that I haven't shared with you guys, but I went through about a 90-day, every day filled with anxiety, couldn't sleep at night, all because I don't wanna leave my kids. If you guys know me, you watch me, you listen to me, you know, my kids are the most important thing in my life. And I love waking up every day. I love having family dinners. I love family meetings on Sundays. I take them to baseball practice, practice, go to baseball games. I'm at every dance recital. I like to be there for homework. I love to cook for them. I love to play with them. I mean, I, I love working and growing and I love my kids. And my parents were married and divorced a bunch of times. So the thought of divorce and ripping the family apart ripped my soul apart. It, it opened up worries and anxieties of things that I tucked down when I was a kid, when my parents split when I was three and then married and left, married and left, nine marriages between my two parents. I had this inner demon, this inner fear that I tucked down many, many years ago. And when the thought was real, when a year ago I knew the divorce was inevitable, we tried a lot of, I don't want to say we tried, like, oh, we gave it a shot. We went to therapy, we talked, we spent a year uh, seeing if we could make it work. And unfortunately we couldn't. My, my relationship with my ex is this dear friendship, but telling the kids, leaving the kids, I, I can't even tell you the feeling I experienced. My empathy, my compassion, my heart goes out for another group of people that have to deal with that. Um, I dealt with it as a kid, now I was dealing with it as a parent. The reason I'm sharing that is because as much as I think I got my together and I work on my personal growth. I work on success. I'm the, I feel like in my own head, this is kind of like my own thing. I'm like, I'm a man. I'm a boss. I take care of when stuff goes sideways. I got it. If a building was on fire, you want to be standing next to me because I'll get your ass out. The company's crashing. I'll save your company for you. Any, anybody in my family has a problem. My parents, I've been supporting my parents since I was in my 20s. My parents have problems emotionally or with friends. I'll take care of it. Friends come to me. I got this. I got you. I love that. I love being the guy. I love being able to serve you. But all of a sudden, I get hit with something and it takes my feet out. I mean, luckily, I go. I went down and spent some time with Tony Robbins, talking to him about it. I'm dear friends with Dr. Daniel Amen. I spent a couple days with him. I mean, I'm so lucky that I have access to great people, but still, it took my legs out. So why am I taking the time to share this with you, to be so vulnerable, to, to let you in on the deepest part of me? is because I don't ever want you to think that I that my life is perfect. I don't want you to think that successful people, everything's just aligned, the, the, the clouds open and the sun shines and life is perfect. No, we have to deal with shit. And I'm not saying your shit's worse or better than mine. I just wanna be vulnerable to tell you that though it was the scariest thing in my life, hands down, uh, you ha might've had some traumatic stuff as a kid, I did as well some crazy stuff that maybe that'll be for another podcast with thinking my mom was going to die and and father go to jail like crazy stuff that I but none of that compared to this thought of leaving my kids and it was so scary it was if you 
I mean, for me, my internal clock was like I was going to die. That's how I felt. So why do I say that? Because I was so scared of it and I wanted to run. I wanted to go back. I wanted to just leave it the way it was. I'll stay in an unhappy marriage. Both of us should. So we'll be there for the kids. I want to make all these decisions just to leave it the way it is. Like the pain was so bad. I wanted to put the cork back on the bottle. And the reason I want to share this with you today is because that would have been the worst mistake of my life. I had to face my biggest fear. If you notice for the last year, I've been talking a lot about your next level of life lives on your biggest obstacle, your biggest stress, your biggest worry. I'm not giving you permission to end a bad relationship or, or, or just run in the other direction, but face it. If you have to fix it, take it to another level, get the right capabilities and your business in your life. If you're worried about your job and if you quit, you'll go broke, face it, work hard to get the promotion or, or burn the boats and go start your own thing. I, I'm just telling you, with all the work that I do, I was an inch away from going backwards. And I thank God for the great friends I have. I thank God for the influences I have, the books I read, the people I know. Most, most of my information comes from books and trainings that I've purchased at, at, at myself in areas that I don't feel I'm as strong. But now let me tell you the other side. I'm in a place now where, again, my ex and I are the dearest of friends. Our kids come first. My kids have been told. They know their mom and dad are divorced. Uh, my ex got a new house. We got her all set up in there. And we're both thriving. We're on the other side of our biggest obstacle. We're on the other side of our biggest pain, the other side of the anxiety, the other side of the worry. And I want to share this with you because it didn't happen overnight. I couldn't fix it immediately. I was having anxiety and I was trying to talk myself out of it and think myself out of it and keep myself busy and none of it worked. I had to lean into it. I had to face it. I had to look inside. I had to sit with it, but I've grown and I'm another version of me. You know, I always felt like the underdog. I was always small in school. I was literally, hands down, not just kind of the smallest kid in school. I was the smallest kid in school. Plus, we didn't have any money. I mean, I, I say that it's not like the story just for my marketing. I, we truly didn't have money. My mom worked two jobs to make 90 bucks a week. My dad worked in his collision shop to probably make 25, 30 grand a year, worked his butt off. They were hard workers. They, they had, there was no correlation between hard work and making money though. It's smart hard work, right? But I wanna tell you a story. When I was in my 20s, I became the New England Championship Grass Dragger with a snowmobile. That sounds weird, I don't know if it's called, it's grass drags, you race on grass, five to 700 feet, drag racing with a snowmobile. You put these big long paddles, uh, these spikes with paddles in the in the, um, in the the track, you, you bolt them in, you, you, you change, you lighten the machine up, and it's really just this major like, I mean, I'd go 100 miles an hour and 500 feet. Is that crazy or what? But here's the thing. I was absolutely the underdog because I didn't have any money back then. I mean, I had some. I was working hard. This is my time in my 20s. I'm doing real estate. This is early 20s. Doing real estate, working on cars every day with my dad at the collision shop, that type of thing. But I didn't have the money that some of these people had because when I started getting good and I started winning more and more, um, I was ramping up so I would um, I would go to these meets where it would be like the New England Championship so there would be I parked the car okay no hands because I haven't parked the car there'd be uh, people from all over the eastern part of the United States and all of a sudden I'd go and there'd be Team Artie Cat and Team Polaris and, and Team Skidoo big tractor trailers they'd take their machines off with a forklift they'd have a crew of 10 people with all awesome shirts on they're fine to them and these snowmobiles were so loud so, rang, rang. i don't know if you ever raced motorcycles or snowmobiles this loud deep throttle and i would go there with my pickup truck with my snowmobile on the back i had all my uh tools in an old milk crate you know like the the plastic square milk crate all my tools stacked up and you have to have ways to lube the track i had like a handmade way to lube the track and i had a, a leaf blower that would cool down the engine because you'd race in the fall and the spring so sometimes the snowmobiles got hot because they like to run in the cold weather right they're designed for snow so i'm telling why am i telling you this story because i was thinking about it like you might feel like an underdog and what's the definition of an underdog? Maybe you don't have money to get started. Maybe no one in your family supports you because they think you're nuts that you want to do your own thing. Maybe you live in a country, a world, a town, a city where <clears throat> people are discouraging or it doesn't seem like things are good. Or maybe you feel like you're an underdog because you were born during a bad time. Or, or maybe you had some really tough things in, in your past. Maybe you're married to someone or dating someone who is negative and, and 
tells you what you can't do. I don't know, but we all have that little bit of underdog feeling inside. <clears throat> and most of the time it can squash us. It can keep us small. But I want to tell you, uh, I teach my kids for their, for softball and for baseball. I teach them that you win races, you win games when no one is watching. And I've been implementing in that, that to them because I want them to practice like you don't win when you're on the pitcher's mound and you get the, the glory. You don't win, I've said this before, but you don't win as a rock star just when you're up there jamming to 50,000 people. You're winning when you're throwing 100 balls in the dark when no one's watching up against the fence or you're jamming on the guitar you know, till late at night when no one's watching that. You win when no one's watching. Well, I won New England State Snowmobile Championship when no one was watching. You see, I was the underdog. These people I ended up racing when I got to the highest level. And I used to race, I had a, a Polaris 650. Not that that means anything to you. It was a 1989 Polaris 650 snowmobile. But I, that, I raced in the 650 class, the 700 class, and the 800 class, and I'd win all three of them. Now, I didn't have the money these other guys did. I didn't have them full-time set of mechanics. I didn't have a tractor trailer with separate engines and new clutches and all this stuff. I just had me and a buddy would come with me, a buddy or two would come with me in a milk crate and my tools in it. But you know what I did when no one was watching? Uh, being the underdog, I knew I didn't have the money, I couldn't beat them, I couldn't outspend them, um, I couldn't hire a full-time mechanic, I, that wasn't my life, I had worked all day with cars and real estate and on weekends I'd go do that. But what I used to do is I'd go out in the apple orchard behind my house when no one was watching and I perfected uh, this I don't want to get too technical, but I perfected the clutching because I couldn't afford to get my motors redone a lot to get a lot more horsepower. Cars go faster with more horsepower. But I worked on the clutching, meaning how fast the snowmobile shift, how high the RPMs were when it came out. Not that that means anything to you, but what I did when no one was watching, I'd bring my milk crate because I was the underdog. It gave me an unfair advantage because I wanted, I didn't want those people with more money, more, you know, you could think about in every area of your life, right? Think about this, whatever area you're thinking about. I didn't want them because they had more money to be like, ah, what's that guy trying? I loved going in there with my, you know, my, my, I'd pull my snowmobile off the back of my truck and my tools were messed up. And they had all these people and I'd make it to the finals and I could see them looking at me like, how'd this guy get in the finals? And then I'd kick their ass. I mean, I smoked them. I won. There was a time where I went 39 races, 39 first place in a row week after week because when no one was watching, I'd go out in this apple orchard. I'd mark out 500 feet and I'd bring my buddy out there and I'd go, Wah! and I'd go 90 miles an hour at 500 feet. And I'd go back and I'd time it and I'd write it down like, mm, the clutching. I think I could let the RPMs go up. And I, I literally used to have a file that this doesn't mean anything, but think of the, the intricacies of this. I would have a file and I'd file the clutching because in snowmobiles, and I, God, I haven't raced a snowmobile in 25 years, but it's a centrifugal clutch is what makes it shift on its own. It's not like a manual shifter. It's not automatic like your car. It's a clutch system. So inside this clutch are weights. And as it starts going around in circle, the revolutions per minute, it throws the clutches, it throws the weights out and it makes it shift. So I figured a way to like change the angle so they'd flip up quicker or I'd lighten them down. I'd grind a little bit off the side, make them go quicker. And I changed the weights and the clutching. I did all this stuff that I couldn't have, because I couldn't afford the horsepower. I couldn't afford to send my engine out and spend 10 grand to make it just this pristine engine so I messed with the clutching then I took gearing so again I'm telling you all this for a reason I took gear I changed the gears we were racing 500 feet I'd have gears so my snowmobile we go be going as fast as it possibly could at 500 feet if we were racing 900 feet they'd blow by me 100 miles an hour but I got all the juice out of the 500 feet so what's the moral of the story I didn't have the money I was the underdog I didn't have what they had but what I had was a burning desire deeper than they ever could. And that created in, in ingenuity, right? Like I found a way to get the snowmobile to go faster without the money. I played with the clutches. I played with the gears. What in your life can you play with to adjust the knobs? How can you adjust the gears? How can you use your passion, your desire, your that underdog feeling instead of the anchor, the wind behind your sail? The biggest lie we've ever been told in the history of the world, or one of them, is that we should get strong at what we're weak at. The hell would that Get amazing at what you're good at because when you work on the things you're good at, the things that make you thrive and feel alive, your confidence goes up. When your confidence goes up, then everything else starts to get easier. You don't look at things as a problem, you look at things as a challenge. When you walk into the meeting to ask for the promotion, ask for the raise, ask for the partnership, you don't go, oh my God, will this work? Maybe I should be happy. You go, no, I got this.
when you think someone is being rude to you, someone doesn't want to be the partner, the, 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 the relationship, there's no support, like all of these things that distract us from the things we really want, the money we want to make, the abundance we want to create, the company we want to create, we're letting all these things uh, uh, ding our inner confidence, the, the thing that allows us to feel loved and feels feel worthy, feel good enough, we're allowing someone else's cause and effect to create a new result in our life. So what if from this point forward, every relationship you had, when you see the forward facing thing, the taking the hat and throwing it in the woods for my son, or the friend stomping her feet because she didn't get her way, instead of saying, what did I do? Am I good enough? Rather say, wow, have empathy of realizing there was a previous cause to create that effect. Then, here's the here's the whole point of this lesson, then turn the mirror on yourself. What causes in your life are allowing you to affect the current? Is there a cause of the way your parents treated you that you're afraid to start your own business? Is there a cause that you got burned in a relationship and you're not opening your heart to a new one? Is there a cause that your dad treated you like and told you you were never good enough and the effect is you're doing a little bit of that with your kids. Start looking at it that way and you'll have empathy for others and you'll have acceptance of others and you won't let them bug you or let you feel a certain way. They won't ding your confidence and also you'll strengthen the relationships in your life because believe me, you're gonna find crap that's lingering from your childhood, from previous relationships, from your parents, that you're screwing with other people where you could fix it. I remember hearing a story where this couple wanted their whole life, their, their dream, their desire, their whole life was to move to the West Coast and get a, a house on the ocean. Well, they saved up their whole life, pushing, their, they, were, they were delaying their happiness, delaying their gratification until they got this house. They get this house, they move in, it's paradise, it's heaven. The first month, every night, they're watching the sun go down, watching the sunsets, having a glass of wine, toasting, baby, we made it. Fast forward six months. This is a true story. At least the person who told me the story said it was a true story. Um, six months later, the wife was like, honey, we have to get blinds put on the west facing windows. It's so annoying. Every night when I'm cooking, the damn sun is coming through the windows and, and it's so hard to pay attention. Wow. Their whole life to watch the sunsets over the ocean became annoying. So we have to watch what we're spending money on and make sure is that feeding some significance that we're trying to prove to someone else we're trying to prove that we made it we're starting to show off the rolex show off the lamborghini uh, listen i think everyone if you need to go through that phase but here's the same thing i tell my kids and i want to tell you figure out what success means to you on the deepest level possible. I went through the fancy watch phase of my life. I have hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of watches. I don't wear any right now. Not that I'd criticize anyone who does. I wear t-shirts all the time now. I have thousand dollar sports jackets because I went through that phase. But what I'm realizing, and I'm realizing a little bit later in life, that's why I want to get to everybody, no matter what age you are, is that the moments in between are what where the magic lives. So I asked you what you were spending money on. I want you to make sure you're investing enough money into you, into your personal growth, into the business you have or into the business you wanna create or into growing yourself so you could be an entrepreneur if that's the right word, like grow within your company. I don't care where you wanna grow, but you need to grow and I wanna make sure you're spending money on things that give you an ROI, either an ROI on wisdom, an ROI on success, an ROI on memories, an ROI on happiness, an ROI on health. So I'm thinking, I, I, I mean, I, what I was thinking even in my own life and I want to share with you is you need to create an audit of where your money is being spent because here's what I know. I'm so far from cheap. I, I, I don't stress about money. I didn't stress about money, spending it for other people especially when I didn't have any. When I was paying on credit cards to help other people out, I, I always had this feeling I know I can create more. Now, do I worry about it? Of course, or I have in the past, but I always knew I could create more money. But when I look back, I realize how much money got spent on things that mean nothing. And now I, I spend hundreds of thousands of dollars on my own education. I go to at least 10 to 12 masterminds every single year. And every time I go, oh my God, I'll gain capabilities on how to go faster on Facebook or write a book quicker or how to market better or how to invest in new real estate and in new industries. 
or I'll get a tip from a guy who's an amazing dad or a mom who's in a great relationship and blow my mind. Like I came here to make more money, but I got a tip on how to bond with my daughter better. Father daughter bonding. This guy's amazing. Boom. Like exponential growth through learning from other people. If you, if someone gives you advice, if you wouldn't replace your life with theirs, they give you advice on how to make money, how to fix your relationship, how to get a promotion. But most of the time people are unqualified giving us advice. The broke friend telling us how to make money. The unhappy, miserable, single friend telling us how to fix our marriage. Bad advice is the most costly advice in the world, but I take it one step deeper. You've heard that before, but bad advice to me dings my confidence. It's got to go. So if, if, if bad advice dings your confidence, then get the push the people out that are bringing you down and making you dim your glow, push them out of your life. Or if they're really close in your life, find a way to not let their words affect you unless you'd rather be them. I'm recording this early Monday morning. I haven't had an inch of food, an ounce of food since Saturday um, because I'm doing a procedure. I'm doing a, a, a colonoscopy. I turned 50 this year. I got to get it done. I've been putting it off. And I want to share that with you, as crazy as that sounds, is because that's life, is doing the things we don't want to do and finding a way to empower and power through them to get to the other side. So let me just give you a little background. Not that you give a crap about this, but my grandfather and a couple of my uncles died of colon cancer. So every five years, I go get a colonoscopy. Uh, I went five years ago, they found some stuff, they said, just do it again, so I'm going, I'm fine, all that. But why am I sharing this? Because I love to eat. I've never fasted in my entire life. I'm skinny and I have to eat all day, every day, uh, just to maintain this uh, massive frame of mine. No, this 150 pounds uh, of, I've been 150 pounds since right out of high school. I have to eat a lot. That's just the way I'm genetically made up. Not eating a meal drives me crazy. Nevertheless, two days and nothing but water. And then I made my kids uh, a massive meal yesterday. I took them for, I took them for ice cream last night because Sunday's our cheat day. I got up this morning, made them an am amazing meal and nothing. So you're saying, okay, Dean, who really cares about your colonoscopy and you're hungry? Woo, big deal. But here's how I like to approach everything in life. And I think it served me really well when it comes to success is there are so many things we don't like to do. I, I, I put this off for a little bit. I should have done it about six months ago. But then I just thought, what are the benefits of me getting this done? Well, peace of mind, massive peace of mind to know that I got nothing bugging me because I want to live to be 100 to be here for my kids and my grandchildren. Um, knowing it's out of the way, knowing a clean build bill of health. I mean, think about this, right? I love that Indian proverb that says, a man who has his health has a thousand wishes. A man who has none has just but one, or has but just one. I'm a little delirious right now without food. But anyway, the reason I'm sharing this today is I think this should be your wake-up call. I think this podcast that you're listening to right now, you're listening to her for me for a reason, I, I, I kind of hit the same points over and over in different ways because that, I mean, if you, if you like a good song, how many times have you listened to it? hundred times, 200 times, 500 times? Well, if there's a message that can empower your life, shouldn't you listen to it over and over until you finally freaking do it? I want you to think about today, this colonoscopy, I, I guess I got to say the pun. It's a real pain in the ass from the food. I got to go get to put to sleep today. I can't drive myself. It's such a pain in the ass. Starting your business is a pain in the ass. Obsessing on marketing more than just your product, sometimes a pain in the ass. Convincing your spouse, your friends, your family, your loved ones, your parents, uh, your significant other that you're going to maybe phase out of your job and scale up your business or you want to start that thing that fills your heart and go with your passion. You want to start music, an online career. You want to start selling stuff on Amazon, start real estate. All that can sound so scary to other people. So then you dim your glow. You turn your brightness down to match everybody else because it's going to be a pain. Listen, everything in life starts as, an, as something that's a struggle, a struggle or annoying or hard or frustrating or scary. But if you just settle, then you just leave your life the way it is. I mean, if your life was absolutely perfect, you'd be listening to something different than my podcast. You want another level of life. And I'm here to tell you, it's just like this damn colonoscopy. I don't want to do it, but I want the results it's going to give me. I, I shared with you guys a, a message or a podcast about going to the gym and about focusing on after. Now I want you to talk about something even more serious. 
is what in your life are you procrastinating on? What if this podcast was your wake up call to be maybe the first time you've heard it and actually implemented it, that you're gonna identify the things that you're hiding from, the things that you're tucking down, the things that you pretend you're too busy to do, the things you're procrastinating on and turn your ship towards that. What if it's time to say enough is enough? I deserve a next level of life. I deserve more. That's why, I I mean, as simple as this, little uh, colonoscopy thing is, I don't want to do it, but I want the end result. So I'm willing to sacrifice a little to benefit a lot. What are you avoiding the sacrifice on? It's time to sacrifice and it's only little. Listen, success is so awesome when you're there because not many people are willing to go through the struggle to get there. There was something I shared with Russell Brunson. He's he's the owner of ClickFunnels, great dude, uh, about about comedians, it's a simple little analogy. And I want you to think about it because he thought it was such a great idea. I think he went and did a podcast on it too. So I'm like, well, if he took my idea and did a podcast, I need to share it with my peeps. So here it goes. I told him how you get good at being on stage. Now this could be anything you do in your life. I just want you to think through this because this is how you write a book. This is how you go on stage. This is how you create the best version of you. I use the analogy of a comedian. Now, a comedian could be funny as heck, but the first week he writes his skit, he's not going to be in Madison Square Garden with 50,000 people. But what comedians do is a comedian will go to all the little comedy clubs around the country and rate, let's rate a joke from one to 10, right? You do a little skit joke, what are they, three to five, 10 minutes long. And when you're done or in the middle of it, you could have people going, ha ha, that was cool, or laughing hard, or crying, or crying and falling on the floor. Think about it. You know those jokes? Um, I remember being a kid, it was, listening to Eddie Murphy, and my God, it was so foul compared to anything I'd ever heard, but it was so funny. <clears throat> I was literally on the floor laughing so hard I couldn't catch my breath. And it seemed like I was, I was doing that for like an hour and a half straight. So how, how does that happen? Because if you go and you practice enough, if you put the time in and you go to all the little uh, dive places, the little comedy places that seat 40 to 200 people, every time you tell a joke that gets a, ah, that was funny, you throw that one away. And every time you get a joke that puts them on the floor in tears, laughing where they can't breathe, that sticks. And if you do enough practice, if you go to enough of the small places, eventually what will you have? You'll have nothing but good jokes because you throw out the good ones and keep testing new material. So when people say, Dean, how are you so good on stage? And how'd you know what to write in your book? Because I've been on stage teaching in front of people for almost 10 years, at least once a month. And sometimes it's 200 people, sometimes it's 18,000 people. And I know when I share something that impacts your life, your personal growth, your personal development, your, your success, uh, the ability to make more money or have more happiness or joy, I know if I have the audience that are like, eh, that was cool, or an audience like, wow, that was good, or an audience where they're coming out of their skin, where their eyes are popping out of their head, where they're writing in their journal faster than they can move, I know that's my funny joke. That's not just a funny joke, that's the fall on the floor. So how does that relate to you? Think about everything you do in life. We don't know how to get better until we uh, you know, show our grit until we hustle, until we work hard. There's so many different words. People, it's a, it's a trendy thing to say hustle or have grit or work your ass off, whatever it is you want to uh, uh, say. But if you're just working hard, you could be running on a treadmill and treadmill. So what is it that you do in your life? Is it real estate? Is it Amazon? Do you have a brick and mortar building? A, a retail business? Do you have a job for somebody right now, but you know there's more? Where can you practice more? Where can you be observant to look for the eyes popping out of their head, you made an impact, the jokes that made them laugh, the things that you do that move the needle, the things that make your business easier, make your clients happier, make your coworkers feel alive, make your boss, if that's what you're doing right now, be like, wow, that's awesome. Look for more of those and guess what? I'm gonna say something so brilliant right now. Do more of that and do less of the things that don't make the jokes, that don't make the people smile. I'm using that silly analogy, and that's why Millionaire Success Habits is such an amazing book. I practiced that stuff. That wasn't just something I dreamed up overnight. It was something I was in my life for the last 20, 30 years, but I wanted to share it in a way to make sure that when people read it, they were engaged, they listened, they wanted it. So I want you to think about that in your life. 
where can you practice? Where can you take the good and grow it, fuel it, make it better, and take what's not working and throw it away? Sometimes to have a breakthrough, we have to break something. It's what's called creative destruction. What do you have to throw away in your life and what do you have to focus on? I think so many people are so used to being different people in different circumstances that maybe we don't consider it lying, but are we doing uh, 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 brutal transparency, I guess is the or brutal honesty, are we? Because I know my life went to another level when I just became honest. I share pretty openly, especially on these podcasts, that in my business life, I was so transparent, transparent with my employees, my team members, uh, uh, my customers, my clients, my marketing, my training is just, I, I just exude transparency and I wanna get better at it uh, continually. I wanna be authentic at the deepest level possible. I think that's the connection that I, that I think that's the reason these podcasts are growing so fast, Instagram's growing so fast. I don't like the hype, I just like real. But I have to tell you in my personal life, I wasn't that transparent. I, my marriage, even though I love being a dad more than anything in the world, even though uh, my ex, now ex is still a great friend and a wonderful human being, our relationship hasn't been good in over five years. And I hid that. I didn't talk about it. Uh, I, I did so many things to avoid it and not be brutally honest because when I, when I went towards being brutally honest, there was pain, so I'd back off. And it seemed easier to kind of pretend to live a lie, to, to tuck it into a compartment and put a lock on it. And I was wrong. And I look at that with my businesses and in your life. If you are holding back a secret, if you have uh, 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 people in your life that you wish you could be transparent with, wish you could tell them what's on your mind, but you don't, and you go, that's okay. If you, if you're around a friend, a coworker, someone who works with you, a partner, um, and when they leave, you talk bad about them when they're not there. Those things aren't hurting the universe, they're hurting you. Flow state, what does that mean? Okay, so I was in flow state yesterday, and in a four hour period, I would bet to say I got more done in those four hours than I did in the previous four or five days. And what flow state does to me is compress time. It's, it's, you can get hours and hours, you can get 15 hours worth of work done in literally an hour. It seems impossible, but it's not. And every successful person I know gets in the flow state. So what is flow state? To me, that's a time when you're living harmonious with the universe, with God, with, with your bigger future, and it's your, your, your talents are flowing through you. It's when you look at the clock and four hours go by and it seems like four minutes. It's not when you're looking and going, oh, another hour to lunch. You look and go, holy shit, there's only an hour left until lunch. I want, I don't, man, I'm not quitting, I'm gonna eat it and I'm gonna, call, I'm gonna call and have food delivered. It's when you know you're making an impact that's moving the needle in your life rather than just busy work that's lit making you continue to run on a treadmill. You could put the treadmill on one or you could put the treadmill on 12. It doesn't matter how fast your legs are moving, you still are in the same place. So if you feel like you're in the same place, even though you're going faster, then I want you to think about flow state. Now, flow state for me is first off, it's working on the things that move the needle. You really need to differentiate that in your life. You might be busy as if you're listening to me, I bet you're a baller, you are a mover, you're a shaker, you're a hustler, you got grit, all the common new buzzwords that people are using, that's great. But if you have grit and you're a hustler and you're working on the wrong things, then you're kind of white knuckling, you're, you're forcing yourself and you're not moving the needle, you're not going anywhere. Or sometimes you might have had a busy day and you come home and want to work on your own business and you white knuckle go, I need to do this. I, I feel bad. I'm not working more on my own business or my own dreams or the promotion I want. And you kind of force it and then the needle doesn't move and you're like, ah, oh, it's like self-fulfilling. Like it's really not helping. Maybe I should stick in this life that I really don't like. No, you shouldn't. You need to switch everything up a little bit. That's why you're here. That's why you're gaining the millionaire success habits. Again, I, I've, I didn't, I didn't invent this stuff. I've just, just been through it all and I get to share from the other side of, of success and failure. So here's what I want to share. I want you to think about creating, first off, the atmosphere for the, for the, for the perfect working environment. Now, I don't know if 
you like working in a busy coffee shop where people are coming in, you got your earbuds on, you like the energy. I like that kind of stuff. I like going to the hotels in Phoenix. I just drove by the Royal Palms. That's a place I go and work all the time. It's got the right music. It, the sound is, it, the, the atmosphere is great. The temperature is always perfect. There's a waitress that comes and brings me my green tea and brings me snacks. And I, I'll sit there with earbuds and work for hours. I can get in flow state there. I can also get in flow state um, when I'm, literally in the busiest place possible, like a coffee shop with lots of busy people. I like the energy. My buddy Joe Polish likes to go to libraries where there's no one and it's quiet, but that helps him get the flow state. So for me, atmosphere. I love when there's kind of like spa music playing. I love making sure I got a kombucha and a green tea and a water and healthy snacks that I don't have to move. I love physically looking at something. I like looking at Camelback Mountain that I'm driving by right now. I like looking at a pool or the mountains or just something that stimulates. If I get in those, that helps the atmosphere. Secondly, other things I do. If, I'm, if I feel I'm getting in the flow state to work on something that's gonna move the needle, I will also, um, I will shut off my phone. I will tell everybody I'm checking out. I won't answer emails. I won't answer, I won't go on social media. I won't record a video for you guys if that's not what the part of my flow state is. I eliminate all other distractions. I write down the one to three things that I want to accomplish while I'm in this flow state and I set myself up for fail or for success. Because in most days, the complete opposite is we set ourselves up for failure. We want to get more done. We want to accomplish. We want to start the new business, write the business plan, get the marketing done. Uh, get the real estate deal done, make the offer, but we set up so many distractions. We're trying to do it while we're juggling kids or we're trying to get homework done or, or, or busy work done for our, our, our regular nine to five job and we set ourselves up for failure. So this is a little call to action. I stopped so now I can look at the camera. This is a little call to action for you guys. Do you remember a time in your life that you got so much done in a short period of time. Could have been yesterday, last month, last year. You got so much done and you felt amazing. And when you're done, you felt that sense of accomplishment. Those are flow states. I didn't name it. I think there's a book, Flow State, or, or I, I got it from somebody else. But I know when I'm in it. And yesterday, I literally compressed time and I accomplished so much. I got done, I was like, holy crap. Look what I got done. So I'm gonna encourage you guys to decide what's busy work and what moves the needle. Make a list of needle movers. Then pick one or two only, and then find the place that satisfies you. I Yesterday I was at my house, there was no one home. I put the music all through the house, like spa music. I got all my drinks, I got my snacks, I put on the most comfortable clothes. I sat facing the mountain where I live. I just lined up everything and I sat there and whoa, magic happened. What's your atmosphere? Then what are your thoughts? Shut off your phone, tell everybody you can't, even if it's for an hour. And then immerse yourself in your goals. Start thinking about what your life is gonna be like when you get to your next level. Get yourself in a space of abundance. Get yourself in a space of gratitude. And then attack the one or two things that move the needle. And don't focus on anything else. Don't be distracted. Don't check email. Don't check Facebook. Don't check Instagram. Don't check how many likes you got. Stay in that space. Get into flow state. And watch the needle move with your accomplishments. Stop running on a treadmill. Be a ladder entrepreneur climbing to your next level. There is no faster, quicker, better, or easier way to gain knowledge than surrounding yourself with people where everybody's getting smarter, where everybody has a desire to go to the next level, where everyone uh, has the same uh, uh, values as you, people who want to go to the same level as you, and uh, nothing could be better. But here's the cool part. When I do a mastermind with Russell Brunson and Brendan Bouchard and Lewis Howes and Trent Shelton and... and so many incredible people, uh, Tom Bilyeu and, and other great, great, greats, your head just spins because every time you bring something up, they have something they've experienced. That's the power of a mastermind. I don't mean to digress here, but I just want to remind you, if you surround yourself with small people, you'll end up dimming your glow. If you surround yourself with people who inspire you, you'll go to the next level. We all have to pay success tax. Everybody wants to be successful. Everybody wants to make more money, but who's willing to pay the price of it? Who's willing to realize that we have to go through the shit to get to the glory? People who think there's the overnight money machines or you can get rich by inventing something or, you, or the other people got lucky. None of that exists. Once in a, an outlier, people get lucky. What would just be the recipe or a formula, or your initial advice you would give me to having just a more fulfilled business, a more fulfilled life, a more fulfilled spirit and existence, 
What would be just your, I mean, there's a million things you yeah, could say, yeah, but the, if you could give them something to start with, what would it be? Um, I would say, and I might have covered some of it, is mm -hmm. really know where you want to steer your ship. Mm -hmm. Like, what happens is, I think, we become somebody for our parents when we're young, and then we might become someone for a relationship we're in, and we mm -hmm. come, become someone for a boss that we have, or mm -hmm. a coworker, or, or a partner, or our employees. And then we become someone if you go to church on Sunday, and then you become somebody every once in a while, you sneak out to the club, and then you're someone there. And we become all these people that I think what happens is, inside, we knew we had this destination of what we wanted, but it gets diluted by all these things, all these realities, like we should cover the mortgage, we should have the money so the kids can go to college, or I should not go, like, we have all these things and we forget who we are. What I would say is spend some time on remembering who you really are and what you really want. And start saying no to all the that doesn't point you in that direction. The only reason you're not going where you want to go is because you're fragmented. It's like fuzzy targets don't get hit. You need a crystal clear target. And I would say just spend time, pretend it's a year from now or five years from now, and you're living the life that you wanted. Maybe the life when you were younger, the life before all the, cl the clutter, and find what that is, and find a way to obsess on it, and find a way to stop doing all the other I mean, I keep getting simpler and simpler. I start, I, I've been dressed, I got like 20 of these t-shirts. Yeah. I got hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of watch. I stopped wearing, like, I, I'm finding myself getting mm. simpler and simpler because I know where I want to go mm. and nothing else really matters anymore. Now I've got a special bonus clip that I think you're going to enjoy. But before that, it's time for the question of the day. I want to know what was your single biggest takeaway from this video and your plan of action for the next week. When you watch a video and just get motivated, you have a 35% chance of actually following through. That's what the science says. And that is not good enough, Believe Nation. We need to do better when you actually get motivated and then create a specific plan of action for what you're going to do this week, you have a 91% chance of following through. And when you publicly commit to somebody else, like leaving a comment below on this video, it jumps even higher. So I want that for you. I want to know your single biggest takeaway from this video and your plan of action for the next week so I can celebrate with you. When I was young, I'm talking 10 years old, we didn't have any money. I lived with my dad, maybe I was probably 11 or 12. I lived with my dad, we didn't have any money, but all my friends were racing BMX. That's when BMX was huge. Um, maybe it's still big, but that's when it first came out. It was exciting. And my friends were getting really nice bikes and I couldn't afford any of those. In fact, I fell in love with a bike called a Hutch. Uh, there was Diamondback and Hutch. They were the two best brands back then. Like people would buy a mongoose. It was like a lead balloon. I mean, you couldn't even pick up a mongoose at the time. But these uh, Hutch, this Hutch bike was all alloy or whatever kind of metal it was that was so light and it was amazing. So not only did people get a Hutch, so I'm going and I'm watching the BMX, uh, the, the uh, bicycle motocross. I'm watching the races and man, these kids are flying. and. I had a big old heavy bike and I wanted a hutch. I wanted a bike that you could lift up with one finger, but man, I wasn't even close to the money. Plus I'm going to school, plus I have homework, plus my dad made me do all the chores I had to do, right? So then I figured out, how do I get the money to buy a hutch? Now, of course, my dad, my grandmother, I live with my dad and some of my grandmother, um, they supported me, but they didn't have the money. So I asked my grandmother if I could clean out the garage and clean out the basement. And anything I found that she didn't want, could I sell it at a garage sale? Now, this is summer vacation, right? So get into summer vacation and I find all kinds of stuff that she's like, oh, I'm not going to use that for years. I don't want that. I'd throw that out anyway. And then I asked my grandmother if I could do that in her friend's garages and basements. So I went to her friend Evelyn, and oh my God, I found so much great stuff. So I went to three different places, I accumulated all this stuff, and I did a garage sale every weekend on the front yard of my grandmother's house. I'd walk like a half a mile to the main highway, main highway for a little town. I'd, I'd pound in a sign, yard sale, and I sat there and I learned how to sell. Because people would come, and there'd be five bucks on something, I'll give you two. I'm like. I don't want two, five's better, but how about four? How about three, 350? So I'm negotiating week after week. So I do this about four weeks and I make like 250, maybe 300 bucks. My dad reminded me of this story, but I remember it was a lot, I'd say like a gazillion dollars. But guess what? A Hutch bike at the time, just the frame was like 400 bucks. Then you had to buy the alloy wheels. And I wanted the skinny ones. If you know anything about it, it was just, I wanted the skinny wheels. Then I wanted Shimano, uh, Shimano pedals and I wanted uh, the better ball bearings, and I wanted this cool little Uno seat. I think it was called the Uni, Uni seat or Uno seat or whatever. It's a cool little plastic seat. I mean, this thing was gonna be so light. And 
250 or 300 bucks wasn't enough. I'm like, wow. So now I'm heading back to school. My dad at the time owns a collision shop, but he also used to buy, he'd go to a, a, a auctions where if you got in a car accident and your car was wrecked and it was totaled or just stolen recovery, it would go to these uh, auctions that my dad would go to and he'd buy a car that was wrecked, but not too wrecked and he'd fix it up and he'd sell it. So I said to my dad, hey, can I buy a car? Can I buy a car for 250 bucks and then I'll fix it on my time and I'll pay you for it? Literally, I said, uh, I'll fix it on my time. My dad's like, yeah, you'll pay. If you do that, you gotta pay for all the expenses, all the parts yourself. So I'm like, cool. So now I'm back in school. I give my dad the 250, 300 bucks and he goes and buys a Mercury Capri. Now I'd love to say the day, the year, but it wasn't even the 80s. It was probably like a late 70s car. Um, now it's probably an 80s car. I don't know, late 70s, 80s. And the, it was a Capri. And I had already been working with my dad since I was a little kid working on cars. So I knew cars and he didn't help me much at all. He even said that. He goes, I, I let you struggle. And God, I, I, I learned that parenting style from my dad. I want to. I hope I'm doing a good enough job with my kids because my dad didn't have the money. He didn't have the time. He had a hustle. So he's like, you want to wreck? I'll buy it for you, but you're paying all the fees and you got to work on it. So every day I could after school. Now I'm still going to school, still doing my homework, still doing my chores, right? It's still my regular gig. But every day after school, that I could, I'd go work on this Capri. And I remember it was the first time I wrecked my knuckles so bad trying to get a bolt off that I couldn't and it slipped and it scraped on the other ones. I'd go to school, my hands greasy and knuckles beat up, but I worked on that car. It probably could have been done in a week and it probably took me three months. And when I got to the painting part, I remember I paid the guy that worked for my dad to come in on a weekend and paint it because I didn't know how to paint back then. Long story short, I get the car done, I sell it and I profited 900 bucks. So I took 250, rolled it over into a wrecked car, redid the car, and I made $900. And I went and bought my Hutch bike. I bought the pedals, I bought the ball bearings, I bought these cool little alloy wheels that were really thin, I bought the thin little tires, I bought the uni seat, I bought these cool handlebars, I even bought some, some gear to work out in. And I got my bike. Now. Was I ever good at racing BMX? Hell no, I sucked. I was little. I'd go week after week and get my ass kicked. I got think I think I got two trophies in probably a whole two seasons, but I loved it and I wanted to go every single week and I I loved this bike so much because I earned every ounce of that bike, every inch of that bike. I fought for it. I paid for it. But how does that relate to you? Because in life, we think there's these magical ways, these quick ways, these shortcuts to wealth. We think there's these shortcuts to the, get the things that we want. Our, our new hutch might be your house, might be the car, might be freedom, but we want the shortcuts. Listen, at a, at a young age, I was going to school. That was my day job. I still had to do it. I did homework. I did my chores, all my responsibilities I still had to do while simultaneously every moment I could, I squeezed into garage sale, and then, um, and then working on this car. There's no magic money machine. You still gotta do the yard sale while you do your homework. You still gotta fix the car. This is metaphorically, while you're doing your chores and going to school. But the end result is I got what I wanted with a little bit of extra hustle. But that momentum carried my whole life. When I was in the collision business, I worked on my real estate business. But I had to go work on cars every day and finally got real estate making money. And then I'm in the real estate business. I wanted to teach others, so I was still working on real estate every day. But I'd work at night creating courses and programs. And then when I was doing I wanted to go on live events. I still worked on courses and programs while I worked on my live event business. I still had to hustle. I still had to find enthusiasm. I still had to be excited. I still had to get things done and I still had to pay the bills. Going to school, doing homework, doing chores is the same as working in a collision shop while I'm working my dream of real estate. Working on my dream of impacting other people while I'm still working on real estate. If you want some amazing motivation from Ed Milet, check out the video right there next to me. I think you'll love it. Continue to believe and I'll see you there. I can't tell you why I'm this way, but I do believe it was baseball. I never took it personally when a coach said, you're dropping your shoulder. In other words, because of athletics, when a guy said, spread your right leg out, your legs are too close together. I never thought, I suck, I can't hit. 